rookie. He likes the dramatic entrance. Thank you. I had to get my cell phone. <laughs> Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the uh, Board of Select Me meeting for September 11th, 2018. Uh, previous to this meeting, the board met in executive session to approve executive session minutes to consider litigation strategy with respect to petition of Eversource Energy for zoning exemptions, to consider purchase, sale, lease, or value of real property in relation to open space preservation, center trail, town hall, the Main Street Corridor project. So. With no, without further ado, uh, I would like to start the meeting by reciting the Pledge of Allegiance. Would all please stand? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. And this being September 11th, the 17th anniversary of the attacks on our nation, I would like, before we begin, to ask for a moment of silence in remembrance of all those who perished, including Hopkinton's own Christopher Zarba Jr., and th all the heroes who gave their lives trying to save them. May we have a moment of silence, please. Thank you. As is our custom, we will begin with our public session, uh, um, a public forum. Uh, I do know there are some items on the agenda tonight that are of tremendous interest to people, but I would remind you that the public forum uh, is for residents to share ideas, opinions, or ask questions regarding town government. Uh, and, and should not be an occasion for comment for items that will be later addressed within this meeting. Are there any public comments? Mr. Harrow? First, I want to thank our three recipients for jobs well done. I actually have a litany of things, but I'm gonna hold it to one. Thank I understand you. that we have recently passed 1,400 square feet of town-owned land to facilitate a private party's development. And I'm curious to know how this was done, because I would think that normally it would require a vote at town meeting, but maybe I don't have the details exactly correct. So if you could, someone could fill me in on that, I'd appreciate it. Thank you. Could you help? I'm not quite sure I know what you're referring to. Do we know? Is, is there someone that through, can through, throw, through, shed some light yes. on this, please? <laughs> yeah, through the chair, I, I, I believe that this is in regards to the, the Chamberlain Road project. I, I don't have the specifics. Uh, That's correct. I was trying yes. to not be pointing fingers or anything and trying to be, but yes. Yes, I, I, I'm not familiar with the details. I'll need to review the issue with Elaine and the town plan. Okay. All we can tell you. Wish I had a better answer right now. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. My, my, my sources may have been somewhat misconstrued. Thank you, Ed. All right, and are there any other public comments tonight? Okay, then moving on. Um, and I also just wanted to mention to all of you watching at home, uh, many of you know there's an item later on our agenda of great public interest. Uh, 
if you are watching at home, I would recommend that's a very good place for you to be. Uh, this room has a very li limited seating capacity. Uh, one of the reasons we held it here at HCAM is because we have the ability, even though the seating capacity is small, to do the live broadcast, which is very important for everyone. So. Um, if uh, you are watching from the comfort of your home, I would recommend, uh, I would recommend that. Thank you. All right, um, first on our agenda, uh, we have uh, a very nice employee recognition. And this is of Denise Hildreth, John Knees, and John Westerling. So first, the Board of Selectmen will recognize town employee Denise Hildreth, Director of Youth and Family Services, who received the Unsung Hero Award on June 20th, 2018, from the Massachusetts Commission on the Status of Women. Denise, would you like to come up for a minute and tell us about this? Um, thank you. So um, this was an award that was recommended by Representative Dykema. Um, I was able to go to the State House with my husband and receive the award with, I think, 133 other women from across the Commonwealth. Um, you know, very humble women, women in positions of great authority all across the Commonwealth. I think this is just a tremendous honor. So for a social worker, um, to get an award for giving is like getting an award for living. So it's just part and parcel of what we do. Um, we don't often get recognition, and certainly that's not something that um, feels comfortable for me, um, but it's nice to get. So I appreciate your recognizing me and also Representative Dykema for making the recommendation. Comments from board members? When, whenever Representative Dykema gets involved, always good things happen. So uh, congratulations to you uh, for, for having her behind you and, and making the recommendation. And I think you do a fabulous job here, Denise, on behalf of the community. On, on a lot of issues that, that many of us are aware of and understand, and probably a lot more that we're not aware of, and we don't necessarily understand. We know the hard work that you put in anyway. So uh, I'm glad you're getting the recognition tonight. You deserve it. And uh, again, I think whenever uh, Carolyn's involved, it's uh, good things happen too. So thank you. Thank you. <coughs> Mr. Titsta. So um, if there's ever a, a definition of someone that should be an unsung hero, it's Denise, and I know, I've known Denise since I was a little kid. Uh, I know that she is squirming up here <laughs> with us talking about her. Um, <clears throat> she's been a leader since I've known her uh, from third, fourth grade on. Uh, it's not a surprise. Um, can't even begin to tell people in the audience and in the town how lucky we are to have her. Uh, you know. I don't have a, anything bad to say about her. I've known her for 40 something years and there aren't many people in the world that I've known for 40 years that I can't find something bad to say about <laughs> So, <laughs> Denise. You better leave now. Yeah. So, you know that's reciprocal, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's, that's not that reciprocal. So uh, Denise, we're so lucky to have you and I, uh, that's not all fluff, that's from the heart. Thank you very much. The side of the yeah, table. And, and that's, and, and that's where I'd like to, to pick up. We're very lucky to have you. Um, the, the person that had your position before left some big shoes to fill. And not only did you fill, up, you, you fill them, you, you took it to a whole other level. The things that, that you do and, and uh, uh, just uh, too numerous to mention. And, and for you to, to get this award is just wonderful. You should be getting many more. Thank Thanks you. for everything you do. Appreciate it. You know, it's always an honor to be able to, to, have, to recognize someone like you when you come before us. Knowing that you're an asset in our town, um, it's, it makes me proud to know that you are available to, to all the families in our town to assist and help. And um, I think the fact that you, you won it amongst you know, all the other communities and other people out there, one out of 130, that, that says something. So I'm really proud to, that you, you are a part of our town, your true asset. Thank you for being here. Thank you. Yeah. Denise, unsung hero, absolutely says that the kind of work you do, by its very nature, you're quiet, you're under the radar, you're um, 
discreet, and yet you do such a wonderful job, and, and we all know you're worth your weight in gold, so it's, it's really nice to see this very well-deserved recognition. So it's a delight to have you here tonight. Congratulations. I appreciate it. Thanks. Thank you. If, if I may? Yes, Mr. Kamala. Yes. Please. <laughs> D Denise, um, on behalf of your colleagues at Town Hall, we want to thank you for your fantastic contributions to this community. Uh, your talent, your passion is clearly making a difference. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Denise. And next among our honored guests is John Neese. He is our principal assessor who is the first recipient of the Robert Ella Executive Director, Sco Executive Director Scholarship from the Massachusetts Association of Assessing Officers. The association established an Executive Director Award which is presented to the assessor who is dedicated to mentoring others through their friendship and leadership. John, come on up. The good, the good tax man. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Tell us about this. Hello. <clears throat> so I'm very low key, and I don't really like to be recognized, but <laughs> since you made me come tonight, um, thank you. Um, I am one of about 1,200 assessors across the state. Uh, Bob Elia was our first executive director. He has now passed away. The scholarship um, was set up in his honor, and uh, he was one of my mentors, and I am especially proud to be, uh, to be honored by the association. So. Thank you very much. Any, any board comments? Can I? Mr. Herr. John, you're doing a great job on behalf of the town. Again, not an easy job. There's a lot going on there, and I'm sure you have lots of folks uh, offering their opinion about what the assessed value of their property should be. Uh, so you have to manage a lot of different opinions, like others uh, in the community. And uh, I know that's not easy, and, and I know you do it with grace and style. So we're lucky to have you, and really appreciate you being here tonight. And congratulations on the award. Uh, I didn't know that that association existed. There's an association for everything in life, isn't there? And I'm <laughs> glad you're at the top of the list there for these folks, too. So thanks a lot. Other members. So uh, I would echo Mr. Hur's comments. Um, I will say that your job, it cannot be an easy one, um, trying to go into somebody's house and evaluate their house so they potentially can pay more money in taxes. So. <laughs> Uh, you definitely have more patience than I would have. Um, but thank you for doing a great job. Thank you for representing Hopkin uh, as professionally as you do. And uh, thanks again. Thank you. Whenever I stop in and visit, wow, I'm not allowed. <laughs> visit John at Town Hall. I always joke that uh, in the Bible, the worst thing you can be called is a, is a tax collector or tax assessor. <laughs> and, uh, but he just does such a great job. And, it's, and, 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 it, and as Brian had said, it's, it's, a, it's a hard job. And to try and keep everybody um, uh, satisfied you know, and, and still be able to bring, bring the money into the town. And really, it, it's because of we, the work that you do is, that, uh, is one of the reasons why we, we consistently stay in the black in this town. So thank you very much. You're welcome. I guess what comes to mind, after hearing how loud your voice was, I feel like I need to be louder, but <laughs> what, comes, what comes to mind is, is fairness. Um, I actually just the other day was looking at our, our assessed value and, and how it's gone for the past few years, and I, I keep saying, wow, you know, this is, this is fair. I, I, think, uh, I think you've done a fa fantastic job, and um, all I can say is thank you. Thank you for your service to our town. Thank you. Well, everybody may not love the tax man, but we love our tax man. <laughs> um, I, know, I know it is a hard job, and I know from John's style, he approaches it and all our citizens with just the right measure of um, respect and professionalism. And uh, for that, we are very grateful. And I think the fact that you're the very first recipient of this uh, really says a lot. And it certainly says a lot for uh, the quality uh, that we bring to Hopkinton in, in all of our employees. So thank you, John. Congratulations. We're happy to have you here tonight. Thank you. And
And last but not least is our Department of Public Works Director, Mr. John Westerling. Uh, John is the president of the New England chapter of the American Public Works Association. The New England chapter received the Presidential Award for Chapter Excellence in recognition of its outstanding contributions and service to its membership, profession, and community. And John is the recipient. Congratulations, John. Thank you very much. So through the chair, I was humbled to have received this award um, as the, the chapter president. And first, I want to say that I'm very fortunate to work for a community that allows me to take part in associations like this. So my thanks to the Board of Selectmen and my thanks to the town manager. Um, this was received on behalf of professionals from Massachusetts, Vermont, New Hampshire, Rhode Island, and Connecticut, and over 1,000 members. So it was an honor to receive that. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Herr. It's great to see you rise uh, to, to the top of the, of the pack there, John, with all those folks you just mentioned, a thousand people involved in the organization, and they pick you out. That's awesome. Thank you. Uh, I have seen so much happen in Hopkinton in my years of service on the Board of Selectmen and before on the Planning Board, and how we get things done, and how efficiently we get things done. Uh, I make a phone call about something that I might see or somebody mentions to me, and, you know, I don't, I'll get an email or maybe a voicemail back, but even before I get that, whatever it is, is done. And I think, you know, it, it's all about action uh, in life. You know, we, there's a lot of talk that goes on. There's a lot of drama that goes on in our world. But to see our DPW act the way they do and get things done and get it done with a smile on their face, the guys are always waving and having some fun out there while they're working, which I love. Uh, I just think you guys and you in particular represent the town well. And, I think it's your leadership style that, that makes it happen. So uh, good for you, and, and we're, we're lucky to have you on the team. And I'm excited that you're moving closer to town. I have a little secret on Mr. Westerling I won't put out there, but I think that's great for us as well. So good for you. Thank you very much. A <laughs> little secret you won't put out there. Right? Yeah. So I will say if uh, you're moving closer to town, if you're buying Brian's house, we've got to get a bigger <laughs> salary. <laughs> uh, I wish. <laughs> um, so, Mr. Westling, thank you very much for your hard work and congratulations for this, uh, for this well-deserved accolade. Uh, the roads are uh, they're in good shape. It used to be, in the, uh, in the old days, we would be in Hopkinton, we'd be able to drive around, we'd hit Ashland, Holliston, Upton, Southboro, Westboro, and the roads were horrible. For a while, we had a couple of guys in here, didn't really cut the mustard, we just kind of got by we're back at the when we have snow you're doing a good job with the uh, with the road so you're doing a very good job like I've told you a thousand times you have huge shoes to fill in my eyes with Bobby Bartlett um, you're getting there you're doing a great job thanks a lot I appreciate it thank you very much and, and all of those compliments are credit to the team that I work with and the support of the board the town manager and the community awesome. so thank you thank you What's always struck me about you is how professional you are. Like even now when you were just asked to speak, you still said, through the chair. <laughs> um, no, and, and that's just the way you, you run the department. It's very professional. When, when I was chair last year during the, um, what, what do you have, four storms in March? First storm, third storm, you know, when the trees were down and we were all driving around trying to help out. It was, the communication was fabulous. And then I just called you up about it just a week or two ago with the, um, uh, the road resurfacing that, that's just been completed. It feels so great coming in from Ashland, coming in from Holliston, coming in from Milford, and we've got the best roads. You know, it's just a, it's just a, a great uh, feeling of pride, and I just really want to thank you and, the, uh, and your department for, uh, for doing such a great job. It feels great coming into town. Thank you very much again. Credit to the team and the support of the town. Thank you. So I think the best indication of what a great job you're doing is how little complaints there are. Um, the fact that everything is running smooth, that kind of tells me that you know, we have someone at DPW who's, who's taking care of the town. I actually just had a bunch of friends fly in from all around the country, and uh, we're supposed to go to a concert <clears throat> that was canceled because the water system failed. And they couldn't provide pot potable water. And uh, I'm just kind of thinking, like, wow. <laughs> I would never expect anything like that to happen here. 
Uh, I'm glad we, I'm glad you're on our team. Thank you very much. Thank you. John, you are a total class act, and uh, whenever there's need, you're right there. I think of uh, the, the storms, as uh, Mr. Cotino mentioned this March, where that role as first responder, you and your department uh, did an awesome job of managing an incredibly diff difficult situation, keeping us safe, getting things cleaned up uh, in, in just a record amount of time. Uh, you know, whenever I call John, he calls me right back, or he picks up the phone, or I get an email right back. He's on it. Um, it, it it's just such a credit to you to receive this award. It, it's it's totally well deserved, Thank you and uh, we we are just so grateful to have you. And don't go away while you're sitting there because. We have other things on our schedule, but at the end, we had a town manager's report that included an update on the DPW, and Mr. Kamalo and I thought maybe with you sitting right here in the flesh would be a good time for that report, uh, Mr. Kamalo and Mr. Westerling as well, perhaps. By way of introduction, um, I'm happy to share with the board that the date for the DPW grant opening is now set. Uh, for September the 29th and this is a Saturday and John is here to share some of the details with with the board uh, it needs also to be said that um, um, we have now enlisted the support of the Chamber of Commerce uh, to help us uh, deliver this event what was that, September 29th? 29th on set. Is that uh, hours? Is it all day, open house? Or how how's that working? Tell us about it, John. So through the chair, we don't have any time set. As, as Norman mentioned, we do have uh, collaboration with the Chamber of Commerce going on. We uh, were holding off until we had the majority of the items complete at the garage. We were working through some punch list items. We do still have uh, a sign or two that we need to put up. Uh, the funds were recently released for that, and we've been going through the procurement process. Uh, but we're looking forward to having the doors open to the community so that they can come in, they can take a look at what their investment has purchased, the, uh, the greater efficiencies that have been built into the building and the team. So, we're looking to have a, a wonderful grand opening. Invitations will be going out. Uh, we're just looking forward to sharing what uh, causes me to pinch myself every day to believe that I'm in such a beautiful facility. Excellent. Do, are there questions from the board at all while Mr. Westerling's here? That's good news. So, kind of so like 10 to 4, do you think, in something like that? Will there be any formal period, or is it, I'm just trying to it in my phone here so again the time has not been set uh, but we will have a formal period uh, we'll get those details out as yeah. soon as possible uh, we expect to have some comments we're inviting the the senator and the representative in the board of selectmen and everyone who's been a participant in collaborating on this this beautiful project okay okay good we're all good looking forward to it what's september 29th on your calendar everybody Okay. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you and congratulations again. Thank you. Thank you so much. Okay. Now we have a number of items that are on our consent agenda. And uh, first, our board minutes. The Board of Selectmen will consider approving the August 7th, 20, uh, 2018 Board of Selectmen minutes. Item two is a parade permit. The Board of Selectmen will consider approving a parade permit for Lana Cassidy on behalf of Enter Stage Left Theater for a Halloween-themed 5K run-walk fundraiser to be held on Sunday, October 28, 2018, at 9 a.m., beginning and ending at the Hopkinton Center for the Arts on Loop Road. The course will include the center trail. Expected number of participants is 300. Item three are gifts. The Board of Selectmen will consider approving a gift from the estate of Helen A. O'Brien in the amount of $1,031.55 to the Hopkinton Police Department. Four, a proclamation. The Board of Selectmen will consider approving a proclamation for Metro West Medical Center to commemorate its 125th year anniversary 
And five, we have several resignations. The Board of Selectmen will consider accepting the following resignations. Christina Anderson from the Youth Commission and Ron Yankee from the Historical Commission. Would any members like to pull any of these items out for separate discussion? Like to pull out number three. Number three is gifts, Mr. Catino. Mm -hmm. Okay. Anything else? Madam Chair, I move that the board approve in the consent agenda items one, two, four, and five. Uh, I uh, no, no. I would like to pull out item five, please. So. So my motion would be one, one two, and four. One, two, and four. Second. All right. All those in favor of approving <coughs> items one, two, and four of the consent agenda, please say aye. 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 And the approval <coughs> is unanimous. And we will return to item two, gifts. Uh, Mr. Catino, the gift of $1,031.55 to Hoppington Police from the estate of Helen O'Brien. Yeah, I just again want to yeah. thank the estate of Helen O'Brien. I mean, it's, it seems like every month there, there are gifts really? coming in from the estate of Helen O'Brien to the fire department, to the police department. It, it's such a um, generous family, and um, uh, they've just come through uh, time and time again. So just thank you very, very much. Mm. Helen was the ultimate good neighbor. She gave <clears throat> and gave and gave, and uh, she's still giving. So <laughs> from up there, she's still giving to us. So we have a lot to be grateful for to Helen. So. Thank you. Uh, I would then request a motion to approve uh, the gift in the amount of $1,031.55 to the Hopkinton Police Department from the estate of Helen A. O'Brien. So moved. Is there a second? Second. Thank you. Moved and seconded. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 And opposed. That is unanimous. And I just wanted to address uh, the two resignations and make sure that we do get an, a letter of thanks out to them. Uh, Christina Anderson from the Youth Commission, I know she's had some things come up that uh, have caused her need to resign and she's very sorry about that and we always are grateful when people do take the time to serve and uh, hope perhaps she'll be able to return. Um, and Dr. Yankee from the Historical Commission, I just want to say a couple words about him because he served has served on the Historical Commission for many, many years. I was on that board with him. Um, Dr. Yankee would take intricate photographs of every single structure that was about to be demolished. He kept all the records, uh, the, the, the treasurer's records for the accounts belonging to the historical commission. He, um, when the, uh, the items from the property of Ora Cheney, hundreds of Indian artifacts were uh, the historical commission and society were asked to remove those. He cataloged hundreds and hundreds of items in these boxes, um, indexing things that sometimes didn't even know, couldn't even figure out what they were. So imagine trying to index something when you don't even know what it is. Um, he has just served that board in this town admirably for so many years. And uh, so I just want to put out a big thank you to Dr. Yankee uh, for his many years of excellent service on the Historical Commission. And uh, be sure that both members receive a note of thanks. So I'll make a motion that the Board of Selectmen uh, accept uh, the resignations from Christina Anderson and Dr. Ron Yankee. Is there a second? Second. Moved and seconded. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 And opposed, that is unanimous <clears throat> as well. And we are right on time. Now, we have police officer and firefighter appointments and recognition. The Board of Selectmen will consider appointing, I hope I pronounced this right, Preston Mucheroni and Ryan Polselli as full-time police officers and John De Rivera as firefighter. The Board of Selectmen will also recognize the promotion of firefighter John Sheridan to the rank of lieutenant. Gentlemen, please come up. Uh, do we have someone from the ah, Chief Lee? Good evening. Thank you. Uh, these two uh, appointments. Uh, one is the new position that we'll be able to pick up in this fiscal year's budget. 
very appreciative of the town and the board for the support. And the other is a uh, recent replacement uh, for, a, for an officer. Um, we were lucky to get two great candidates. Both of them have shown a commitment to the police uh, department and the profession. They've uh, been self-sponsored through their uh, police academy. They have attended the state police academy, which some say is harder than others. Is that true? Uh, <laughs> depends who you're asking. <laughs> but they, they both did outstanding in the process, and uh, we're, we're pleased to have them, and we think they're going to be great additions. Uh, first up is Preston Micheroni. These names are getting hotter and hotter. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Preston was born and raised in Natick, Massachusetts. Preston graduated from the Natick High School and then attended Framingham State University, where he received a Bachelor's of Arts in Criminology. Preston worked with uh, youth in Natick for many years in after school activities programs, including tutoring and mentoring. During his college years, he interned at the Massachusetts State Police Violent Fugitive Apprehension Unit, as well as the Mass uh, Massachusetts State Police Exit County Detective Unit. He's an avid out uh, outdoorsman. He'll be graduating from the Mass State Police Academy on September 14th, this Friday. As I said, where is self-sponsored. Introduce you, Preston. Thanks. How's it going, guys? Uh, thank you for having me here. This is an honor. Um, I've heard nothing but great town, um, great things about the department and the town overall. And um, I'm really looking forward to uh, graduating Friday and everything that um, in the future that's being held for me. So I want to thank you guys for uh, your time right now. And it's just an absolute honor to be sitting right here. Excellent. Congratulations. Uh, next is uh, Ryan Polselli. Born and raised in Grafton, Massachusetts, Ryan graduated from Grafton High School and then attended the Florida Atlantic University, received a Bachelor's of Art in uh, Criminal Justice as well. Ryan was actively involved in the Phi Delta fraternity while attending college, and nothing showed up on his background for that. <laughs> <laughs> he has participated in uh, many fundraising events and community outreach programs. He was elected Vice President of Recruitment for the uh, Enter for Nebity Council. Ryan interned at the Massachusetts State Police Worcester Detectives Unit, CPAC, as well as the Palm Beach Sheriff County's office. He'll be graduating along with Preston at the State Police Academy on September 14th. Thank you all for having me. Uh, again, I'm honored to be here. Um, I just, I don't want to let the town down. I don't want to let the department down. Um, I'm looking forward to starting my career and I'm very excited. Thank you very much for having me. Excellent. Well, I don't think either of you are gonna let the town down. We are just delighted to have you join the force and uh, we hope that you will enjoy your, your work here in Hopkinton. It's a great community. Uh, as I'm sure you know from the chief, we're, we've been ranked one of the safest in the state and uh, a lot of that has to do, and I'm sure, with our fine, our fine police force and uh, so I have a lot of trust in the chief that he's a good picker and he pick, picked well. So congratulations, welcome to Hopkinton, everyone. Thank you very much. I, I hogged the comment period here. Other other board members, I jumped in probably when I shouldn't have. Mayor Fon? Just want to say welcome to the town. Uh, it's always it's always an honor to, to welcome new uh, officers to the to our force. Um, no, I know that it makes me feel safer, and um, I know that. My family has availed itself to the services of the police, and uh, they've always been there. So you have a good, uh, a good department that you're coming into. Welcome aboard. Thank, Thank you. you. Yeah, <clears throat> there are some big shoes for you guys to fill because we do have a very strong department, um, number three, uh, rank number three. And, and uh, there's, there's some great mentors. You, you were a great mentor, and, and you're a great fundraiser. And that's, and that's you know, part of the, the um, whole part of being in public safety here in Hopkinton is that um, we like community policing. We also like people out there and mentoring and, you know, and, and also you know, working with the uh, SROs and all that. So great. Thanks very much for coming, and we're glad to have you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. So welcome to town. Uh, I think that you are <coughs> very humble when you come in front of us and say thank you, but I think it's appropriate. You're coming to one of the best departments around, from the chief to the lieutenants, 
sergeants, patrolmen, um, one of the best around. And um, if, uh, if you pass this vetting process and, and they decide to bring you on, then uh, obviously you're pretty locked on, both of you. So uh, thanks for, for coming to Hopkinton. Welcome aboard and uh, looking forward to going to your retirement party from Hopkinton <laughs> in 35 years. <laughs> See you there. Good, all you, buddy. So uh, Preston, you went to Natick High School. Did I you did. play football there? I did. So how is the Natick team this year? <laughs> I know Hopkinton's off to a good start, so. Yeah, but that, that's a Natick, lost, <laughs> Natick <laughs> lost to Needham the other day, right? I believe so. And Hopkinton is playing Needham on Friday, so I want to get your view of how we're going to do on Friday based on what you saw with Natick. Go Hillers. <laughs> <laughs> Hire the guy, too. <laughs> uh, so uh, another sergeant. question I have for both of you, when you guys thought about doing police work and you thought about coming to work for a, a local town and so on, did you think the process was this public for the hiring? If you turn around and look behind you, there's all these people staring at you right now. <laughs> there's five people staring at you here and a couple of them over here. It's a very public process. And you're coming into a job that's a very public job, obviously. And we represent the community. So we're elected. Our boss is the community. His boss is the five of us. right? So we're all interconnected here and we're all intertwined. And you guys are here to help protect our community. But it's your community that's also, quote, your boss. So we all have to work this together. And uh, I think... You know, with the very public process of the hiring, it kind of sends the message of what the job is, which is a very public job where we keep the public safe. So I, I think we're really fortunate to have you guys. I do hope that the Hillers just beat on Needham on Friday mm -hmm. evening. Um, I'm sorry? Natick. No, no, Natick. it's Needham. Needham. They're playing oh, Needham, but oh, Needham okay. played Natick <laughs> last week and beat it. Natick. <laughs> so that's my concern a little bit. <laughs> anyway, but I think it's great you guys are with us now, and we're really excited to have uh, some new people on the force and uh, work closely with the chief and your colleagues in the police department and all will go well. Thank you and welcome. Thank you very much, sir. That was trial by fire. <laughs> <laughs> well, congratulations and welcome aboard. Thank you. We're Thank glad you to have much. you here. Madam Chair. Yay. I move that the Board of Selectmen appoint Preston Mucciarni, did I get that right? I'm close. And Ryan Pulselli as full-time police officers on the Hopkinton Police Force. Second match. So it was okay, so moved and all right, moved and seconded. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 And opposed, that is unanimous. Congratulations. Thank you, guys. Thank you very much. Thank you. And uh, from our fire department, um, uh, John De Rivera is to be appointed as firefighter. And the board will also recognize the promotion of firefighter John Sheridan to the rank of lieutenant. So Chief Slamon, give us the good news here. Would it be okay if I did the firefighter first and kind of jockey you, him in two different you things? You do just, just the way you want. Thank you very much. Your show, Chief. Your show. Uh, thank you very much. First of all, I'd like to thank the board and the community for the support of the fire department and the fact that um, we are appointing a new firefighter to our force. It's a big deal, and uh, it just brings excitement to the air. And um, I'm proud to introduce uh, John De Rivera. Um, John has been a, uh, he's entering his second week on the force at the fire department. He came to Hopkinton from West Boylston Fire Department, where he has two and a half years there, plus some other work in Boylston and Spencer. Um, his background is a bachelor's degree from WPI in biochemistry. Mm -hmm. He has a uh, paramedic certificate program uh, from Quinsigamon, and John has taken classes with the uh, fire academy, and he's uh, firefighter one two certified at this point. Uh, John enjoys uh, spending time outdoors. He's an avid hiker, and uh, he had a wonderful story that he shared with us that. Um, it kind of mirrors something I ran into where I went to school with an engineering background. Uh, at the same time, John was at WPI. He experienced EMT training um, and just caught the bug of public service and being a first responder. 
and he hasn't looked back since, uh, although he is a fine student with his uh, chemistry background. So, not to steal your whole show. <laughs> so, I'd like to welcome uh, John DiRiveria from you. Excellent. Thank you, John. <laughs> Board members, questions, comments? Mr. Hurt. So what's the what's your bachelor's in again? Uh, it's in biochemistry. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. I mean so will that be applied in any way as you fight fires? I mean if you think about this a little bit, there's some of the things that are going on inside buildings these days, right? And some of the materials. You think you'll apply that kind of stuff, or is that just a great background for, for your degree and uh, absolutely. I think um, it applies to uh, firefighting in that uh, all the new chemicals involved today, whether it be um, the off-gassing of burning materials or just the hazardous materials that are on the road and kind of their effects on human health. Um, it applies also uh, with my paramedic background. Uh, it applies immensely to the factors of you know, human health, uh, all the medications we give, how they interact, uh, medications patients are on, um, some diseases they may have, and how all those processes work together. So I think it, um, it definitely helps me a lot to understand it and apply it to my job at the fire department. I think that's great. I, I think that the fact that you're thinking it all through and, and looking forward to applying your knowledge to real uh, you know, situations, I think that's a fantastic opportunity for the community and, and we're lucky to have you. So thank you for joining the team. So John, welcome to Hopkinen. Um, a little background. <coughs> When I took Firefighter 1 in 1989, we learned how to tie knots. <laughs> and you're talking about off-gassing of blah, 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 blah. He's working the over here. So, right? so um, you know, we thought we were pretty good if we could tie a certain knot behind our back. It was one of the requirements. Um, so far be it for me to, to, uh, to put my, uh, my judgment on, on your training. Um, so I'm very biased towards the to Hopkins Fire Department. I think it's the best department around, bar none. Couldn't talk me out of it. You're lucky to be on the fire department. The fact that the chief chose you out of X amount of applicants means that you're cream of the crop. Welcome to Hopkins. Thanks for your, uh, for your future service. Thank you very much. Welcome to Hopkinton. I'm just, I, you know, I, I love the way that the chief is, is growing the department in, in his own image and bringing people in that, uh, w you know, with, with a science background because it is, firefighting is a science. You know, that it's somewhat, it's an art and a science. And it's just great that you're able to, um, to Mr. Horace Per's point, already thinking about how it's going to be applied. Chief, great job, good hire. Thanks for coming. I have the utmost respect for Chief Slayman and uh, the fact that he chose you, that, that says a lot to me. Um, and then hearing your, your background at WPI is, uh, wow, I'm, I'm really impressed. I think uh, there's a lot you can do with that, um, particularly with your paramedic uh, background as well uh, and how various drugs are going to interact and so on and so forth. So really happy to know that, uh, <laughs> that you're on board and that, uh, that you have the background that, that makes me feel confident. So welcome to Hopkinton. Thank you. Just John, you have some amazing credentials. And uh, I, I, I think we're honored that you, you chose us as well as we chose you. Uh, this absolutely speaks to, I know, Chief Slamman's ongoing mission to continue to raise the level of professionalism and knowledge and ability on, on our fire department core. And uh, I think you'll just be a wonderful asset to have. And we certainly hope you enjoy working here because we're very, very pleased to have you join the force. So welcome, welcome, we're, we're lucky. Thank you all for the warm welcome. It's wonderful to be here. I look forward to my time at the department. Excellent, thank you. 35 and years, right? Yeah. <laughs> Madam Chair, one other oh. quick question if I could please. The Chief yes. mentioned something about an engineering background. I was not aware of that, Chief. Our Chief? It? Yeah. Sure. Wentworth. Wentworth Architectural Engineering Technology. How did you do that? You got back and forth on a 1972 Charger. Yep. All with the intent to come out and go into firefighting, knowing how buildings are constructed, or just? No, similar story. I, uh, at the same time, I was a call firefighter and doing that on the side, and uh, I spent a couple co-ops in office, and I said, this job is awesome, so oh, cool. made the choice. Interesting. Yeah. Thank you. 
So just in a ceremonial sense, if I could um, ask uh, John Sheridan, who is his, the new training officer I'm about to introduce to you, um, to do the pinning, because he is now his new mentor, being the new one. So that's just a ceremony that we do. We love it. Absolutely. Just find a spot right there. Oh, you better wait, wait for the wait, camera. Wait, wait, wait for the camera. Wait, wait for Bob. Robert. Robert. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. If you don't, if if you don't, don't wait for Bob, it's going to get <laughs> ugly <laughs> down the road. It's going to get ugly. All right. If Bob didn't take a picture, did it really happen? <laughs> All right. Excellent. And uh, it appears that we also have one more. Uh, Nice announcement here. Sure, if here. I could invite uh, John Sheridan up. Thank you, John. Promoted to rank of lieutenant. So, John, um, just to start off, uh, you know, in the promotional process, there's quite the dedication of uh, time and service. And uh, just initially, I want to thank his wife is in the background, Katie, with their daughter, Ellie, or L, I'm told to say just right, so I don't get in trouble. So uh, we'll bring them up in a little bit. But uh, a lot of hard work in the promotional process. There was um, five talented candidates that were in this process. Uh, it was quite the uh, extensive process, and John, just to his credit, really shined. So I just want to give him that kudos. The, uh, he's been a Hopkinton firefighter since 2014. He also spent an extensive amount of time in Northbridge as a firefighter. and. Um, his background has just been, he was solid from day one in the, entering the fire department. He just uh, obtained an associate's degree, so more hard work in the background um, from Quinn Sigamon College. He has a uh, paramedic certificate from Quinn Sigamon College. He uh, is credentialed or certified by Massachusetts in firefighter uh, one, two, fire officer one, two, fire instructor one, two, hazmat operations level, an incident safety officer. Uh, he also has a background in the American Heart BLS Instructor Association with uh, working on our training in BLS and uh, CPR with the public. He is a statewide intervention, a rapid intervention train the trainer. He, um, on the side, does CrossFit, which I watch them do that. I'm quite amazed. And uh, in the final part of his credentialing is he's also an Eagle Scout. So. I'd like to uh, congratulate John and invite his uh, wife Katie and his daughter L up for the uh, ceremony. Well, hold off one second. I'll let you do your comments and then do that ceremonial piece. Sorry. <laughs> Congratulations, board members. All right, I'll start this All time. All right, Mr. Catino. You know, it, it's just apropos, you know, being the, the um, 17th. Um, year after the after 9/11 and I'm wearing my firefighters memorial pin you. you know really it, it's it, it, to be installing new officers new public safety officers in both the police and the fire side it just shows the, the dedication and and how you know how frightening it must be nowadays to, to go into pull in, into you know uh, the thin blue line and also to continue the uh, as I said the science of firefighting and the uh, being uh, an EMT in, in, in the firefighting side, because you guys run into danger when everybody runs away. So it's just uh, it's, it's a it's a te testament to all of you. So thank you very very much, and thanks for hanging in with us. And and as as um, Brendan will say, you know, you've got a few years in, so maybe just another 20 years here <laughs> for your retirement. Thank you. I just want to thank you for for being here. Um, Again, as I said previously, I have utmost respect for uh, the chief. For him to choose you, that, that means a lot. And, uh, you know, I can't say enough about the work you guys do because uh, it, is, it is a thankless job and it's something that, uh, that it, it takes a special soul to be willing to, uh, to go into the fire, to, to reach for the danger and, and to handle it, to be confident enough to handle it. So thank you. And uh, I'm Congratulations. Thank you. So, um, just sitting here now, it literally just dawned on me. Not that it was 9-11 or that, you know, that this morning at 8.58, whatever the time was, there was the, the ceremonies around the country and certainly in New York and here. 8.46. Um, 8.46, thank you. But your comment, Mr. Catino, just like, yeah. wow. Yeah. 
we're hiring police officers, we're hiring firefighters on 9-11. That just dawned on me. Mm -hmm. And what an amazing tribute, frankly, in some ways, that the community's doing this on 9-11. Um, it, it's awesome. Mm -hmm. It really is. I mean, what happened on 9-11 was unbelievable. I'll never forget it. We all have our story. Uh, but what's happening here today on 9-11 is pretty cool, too. So I'm excited for the new hires today. I'm excited for your promotion. And if there's ever a day to, to celebrate first responders, today's the day. So this is, this is pretty good. Thank you, John, for bringing that up. And didn't, didn't think about it. So I knew I should have gone before Mr. Hurt, because that was my <laughs> thought that he stole. Um, so, um, so John, congratulations. Um, you know, I've known you for however long you've been on, I don't know, a year, 10 years, however long you've been on, I've known you for that long. And, and uh, the fact that the chief chose you means that you're on the straight and narrow and you're doing a great job as a firefighter. You're joining a management team that's second to none. You know, you got your chief, you got your deputy, and all your lieutenants. Uh, you work for these lieutenants, you know that they're locked on as well. Um, so it, it's a, it should be a great honor for you, and I know that it is, to be promoted to lieutenant, leading some of these firefighters, new and old, uh, along. And uh, I, know, uh, I know that, uh, that you are the right choice. So congratulations. Uh, we look forward to many years of you being here, and uh, thank you very much. Congratulations, John. Um, again, the bar is set pretty high in this town, and the fact that you're the one, you're the cream that rose to the top in uh, Chief Slayman's, uh, Slayman, Chief Slayman's selection, uh, that really says a lot about you. We're, we're very proud of you. We're proud that you've, uh, you've been serving our community and, and will you know, be doing even, even greater things. Uh, and, and I'm really grateful to Mr. Catino for pointing out the September 11th correlation today with all these wonderful mm -hmm. promotions and appointments and hires um, on on this day, the day that will live it in for me for our country, uh, the tradition continues of service, of sacrifice, of bravery. And uh, it, it's just such a fitting, a fitting time to be honoring all these wonderful first responders. And so we thank you for stepping up and being willing to serve the town of Hopkinton and uh, just making this the great town that it is. So we're very pleased. Congratulations. And Steve, what do we have? Sure. So in the true sense of celebration for his dedication to this, I'd like to invite uh, Katie and Elle up to do the pinning ceremony. <laughs> How old is Elle? <laughs> Let's see about Four, five, four, five, four and a half. <laughs> Split the difference. Oh, wait, 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 you got to get Robert. Give Robert his chance. <laughs> So through the chair, there are a lot of, part of parts of this job <laughs> that are not great. This is a great part of this job, is to be able to see this. Thank you. Thank you. Madam Chair, before we move on, if I could please, our yes, HR director is here this evening. And uh, all these uh, hires and promotions all flow through the HR department That's in the right. town hall. And I just want to take a second to acknowledge and thank Maria for her hard work and that of the team, everybody that was involved, but she coordinates and we want uh, certainly appreciate everything you're doing as well. Thank Absolutely. you. Absolutely. Thank you, Maria. Excellent. And we are pretty much right on time here. Uh, well, not quite. Uh, we have two appointments to make. The Board of Selectmen will now consider making the following appointments. Beth Watson to the Historical Commission, full member, term expiring 6-30-19, and Brenda Stanley and Brittany Firth as special police officers, terms to expire, uh, three-year terms to expire 6-30-21. Let's take uh, Beth Watson first. Um, I know Beth is here. Um, Beth, you've been serving already as an alternate. Yes. And uh, 
admirably. I know you've done really great work, so uh, you're willing to step up to the full to the full um, full membership. Yes, yes, I am. Okay. I'm um, also on the uh, historic district commission as well. Correct. Okay. I'm delighted that the I'm. We're sorry to see the people who've served on that board step down because they've all done noble service, but I'm really glad to see an opportunity for you to, to move up to full-time membership. So do we have any any comments for, for Beth? Mr. Hurt. If I could please, uh, not so much directed at Beth as to us or the town manager. Uh, I, Beth, thank you for being here tonight. I think it's great that you're ready to step from associate into full uh, membership. That's perfect. And that's one of the reasons why we do this. Okay. Um, is this for the is this for Ron Yankee's position, or uh, is this an additional uh, no, position? It's for, uh, Austin Span. I think yeah. it's Austin, Austin Span. Okay, so then we would have an additional full membership. Right. My understanding, okay. there was another alternate, um, Christine Rumby, and I. My understanding was that she was going to yeah. apply. But okay. I'm not sure. That, that's so we just good. accepted his resignation yeah. this evening, so that will trigger. Yeah. Opening up another, another position. position. Yeah. This is this yeah. is for the yeah. previously posted position from Austin, Spain. Right. Okay. Perfect. Thank you, Beth, for being here tonight. Um, Thank you. Excited to see you step up. All right. Uh, are there other questions, or do we have uh, a I'd, motion? I'd, I'd like to make a motion to appoint Beth Watson to a full member of the Historical Commission with the term expiring 6:30-19. Second. Motion has been made and seconded. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 And opposed, it is unanimous with uh, Mr. Ted Stone not present. So congratulations. Thank Thanks, you, Beth. Thank, you, Thank you. you. Okay. And following Beth, uh, Brenda Stanley and Brittany Firth are to be appointed as special police officers for terms expiring June 30th, 2021. These are three-year terms. Uh, is there anyone that needs to Speak to this, or these are okay. through the chair. Um, these are two members of our dispatch unit or okay. communications unit, and are recommended as special officers by the police chief. All right. All right. So Excellent. I'll make a motion that we um, appoint Brenda Stanley and Brittany Firth as special police police officers with their terms expiring 6:30, uh, 2021. Is there a second? Second. All right, Ms. Mr. Her. Uh, just real quick, Mr. Kamal, you said the police of chief, uh, chief of police, did in fact um, recommend this. Correct. Okay, that's I'm good. Okay, motion has been made and seconded. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 And opposed, that is unanimous minus one. <laughs> okay, thank you. Congratulations. Okay. Good job. Good job. Moving right along, um, we have the Pledge of Liquor License, uh, DKW LLC Central Public House, 42 Main Street. The Board of Selectmen will consider approving an amendment application for a pledge of collateral from Dennis Wilson of DKW LLC doing business as Central Public House, Main Street, Hopkinton, Mass, for a pledge to be approved in the amount of $550,000 to Cambridge Savings Bank. Pledging the license does not affect the Board of Selectmen's ability as licensing authority to exercise its control over the license. So this is a an action that will assess, assist the applicant in getting his business underway, but the town and the Board of Selectmen still maintain control of the liquor license. Correct. Co correct, and in simple, plain language, yes, uh, <laughs> he's, the applicant is requesting to use their license to secure a loan from a bank. I understand. Okay. So let's just walk through what that means, because I'm not entirely clear. So when you pledge your license, I know this has come before us a couple of times, but when you pledge your license against a note, basically the bank can, basically the bank the bank, how does the bank get access to the license to make him pay, the, pay his loan? You know, I don't understand that. It simply takes a security interest on the license. So then the bank could, in effect, remove the license from the premises? Is that true? So that then he couldn't operate if he wasn't paying his bills? Or I don't understand how it works. The bank would not be able to do that. The control over the license remains in the hands 
of the local licensing authority, in this case, the Board of Selectmen. So then how does the, how does the bank get, get a stick in this game? I don't understand that. If, if I could. Please. Nelson Santos on behalf of the petitioner here. Uh, and attorney Peter Barbieri originally filed the application. Mm -hmm. um, so simply what this is, this is just collateral for the bank for a promissory note that was signed. The bank can't come and start operating the restaurant if my client were to stop making payments on the note. The bank would have to take the license away through the process through ABCC and come before the town and do it. Similar to a foreclosure you would have on a home, there's processes in place. So the bank could, in effect, take the license somehow out of, out of circulation or, or away from the, the, the owner of the business through the ABCC process, and that way it gets, that's how they get a little yes. stick in the game. And, and through the town, not just the ABCC. Yeah, They'd right. have to come to the town as well. I know the applicant's never going down this path. I'm just trying to understand <laughs> it so that uh, everything is clear. Okay, okay, I'm good. All right. I'm okay. I'm good. <clears throat> All right. If there are no further questions, then I will entertain a motion. Uh, is there a motions document? Please? Well, there is a motions document right here. I request a motion to approve the pledge of license as requested for the Central Public House. So moved. Is there a second? Second. Motion has been moved and seconded. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 And opposed, that is unanimous with four, four voting. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very Thank much. You. Thank you very much. Nice. Good evening. Madam Chair, can we take a two minute recess, please? I need to hit the rest of I can need to do so too. Um, I'm going to just open the public hearing at 740 yes, and take a recess. Okay. Can, can, I, can we take a yes. recess at the hearing? Sure. Can we open let's it open it and let's recess. recess. Okay. Perfect. All right. Good. You are good on time. The hour being 740, we have a posted public hearing with Dunn Oliveira LLC doing business as Bittersweet Company for a Section 12 Wine and Malt Only Alcohol License Entertainment License at 28 Main Street. The Board of Selectmen will hold a public hearing um, regarding an application for a Section 12 Walt Mine and Malt Only License, a new manager, Julia Curries, and an entertainment license at 28 Main Street from Sharon Dunn of Dunn Oliveira LLC doing business as Bittersweet Company. And Mr. Dunn, um, the hearing has been opened, but I apologize to you. A couple board members have asked for a two minute recess. Sure, no uh, and so if you just uh, get so Madam comfortable. Chair, I move that the Board of Selectmen open the public hearing. Second. Second. All right. All those in favor say aye. 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 Thank you. The hearing is open. We will take a two minute recess and be with you immediately. Thank you. <laughs>
Mike, oh, Mr. Okay. Trojan, are we are we on? Okay. We're back. Okay. Thank you very much for the slight delay. Uh, again, uh, we will be uh, holding a public hearing regarding an application for a Section 12. Wine and malt only license, a new manager, Julia Curis, and an entertainment license at 28 Main Street from Karen Dunn of Dunn and Oliveira, LLC, doing business as Bittersweet Company. Mr. Dunn, welcome. Uh, the board, uh, good evening. Uh, first and foremost, I'd like to thank you all for your letter last year. I received a, a very nice letter from the board uh, thanking us for our efforts downtown and traffic and people to the downtown area. I really appreciate it. Never got the opportunity to thank you guys, but thanks very much. Uh, the town has a, a reputation out there that it's difficult to do business in the town. That's poppycock. I want to first acknowledge all the, the support I've had in this journey anyway for the last two years, but especially in, in this process, you know, where I chose to do it with Julie, uh, more as a, a kind of a training exercise and a development exercise. But uh, the town were very supportive, all the administrators, and a special mention and thanks to... Um, to Norman and to uh, Maria Glynn, she did a great job with us, helping us, you know, understand the process and all the, the cogs in the wheel. Um, Julia landed on my door about six months ago, and um, at the time I was actually having conversations with God to try and recruit, because uh, in this business it's very difficult to find good people, and I did struggle for year one finding good people. Um, I'm now very grateful that I have a really good senior team of people, uh, a lot of middle-aged women from around town, and. Uh, our, our manager, Julia, um, really has taken full ownership of the shop. When, when I hired Julia, I, she asked me, what, what do you want me to do, what do you want me to be? And I said, I want you to be me. And I think, um, <laughs> y you know, like anything else, I found it very difficult to not come in and take a day off because this was my baby and I was in, trusting in somebody else. But uh, in fairness to her, Julia's five out of five as far as I'm concerned. She, she does a fantastic job and I'm very confident that she, you know, will run, continue to run it very well for us. <coughs> Um, the end of the, the, uh, we're here tonight to, to look for an entertainment licence that we applied for a variance on last year from um, the planning board. We were successful in that. Um, we'd like to be part of the, the infrastructure, the commercial infrastructure of downtown. I think we've uh, worked hard to get the, the place to where it is at now. And I guess as a business owner, um, it, it's, you know, it's difficult to make money out of coffee unless you're one of the big guys, you know, and that's been very honest. Uh, what's interesting for me is we've got a great si system that shows us analytics, and the growth in my business has been in the breakfast and lunch. It's been, you know, so that tells me what people want, you know. Um, they don't want a bakery, and, you know, coffee is a subsidiary of, of, of the overall mix, but really the, the huge increase has been um, lunch, breakfast and lunch and tea, you know, people drinking tea now. So, I got right here. Then, yeah, this, so th <laughs> this came about basically because um, a group of women from the town approached me and said, hey, we'd love an alternative to Bills, where there's no children, where we could go and have a glass of wine with our girlfriends. What do you think? And uh, I ran it by a few people, and um, so, some in the town, and they said, you know, do what you have to do to get there, but your difficulty would be the landlord. But I'm here. We negotiated. And um, I hoping that uh, the outcome will be positive but uh, you know I think it's exciting to see downtown coming alive again delighted to see our neighbours coming in uh, I welcome competition I think it's very healthy I think we should have a, a town where, where you know different businesses come in so we just hope that we're uh, successful tonight so that we can be part of that evening entertainment um, if the board uh, approves I would like to kind of give the nighttime business a new identity um, in terms of I want to separate the cafe from the the, the beer and wine license because I think it's very important that people see a transition to two places. It'll trade to as a cafe from eight in the morning till three or four p.m. It'll shut down for an hour or two hours and it'll reopen. And, and I was thinking Dolly Dunn's just uh, it was just a name that came to me. So it'll be bittersweet and Dolly Dunn's she's my dog and you see her all around town with me everywhere I go. But um, you, you know that's that's something that's kind of come to us in the last couple of weeks. I think from a uh, an identity point of view, I think we need to look at maybe calling it something else. And it doesn't have to be in the windows, just on the menu at night, which we're hoping to do tapas um, from around the world, just a couple of small dishes from, from each continent, um, maybe change it out twice a year. And uh, entertainment with it would be fantastic. We're not looking to put in rock bands, although that would be nice. Um, I, I would like to do something that's geared towards the adults in the town as well as, you, you know, we don't seem to have a lot to do with I certainly don't think so. So, you know, an independent film night or international film night, maybe once a week through fall and winter, and 
you know, a two-piece band, maybe a stand-up open mic that I might even host myself. Uh, you know, we're trying to think outside the box and see what's not in the town and to see if we can bring um, some entertainment um, responsibly into the town and to, to keep traffic moving and keep people in that area. I think it's very, very important. Um, I think the, the west end of town is doing great and it's full of brands and I'm really happy, but it's a traffic uh, <coughs> issue up there. And I think that's to be worked to our advantage. I think it will bring, bring people down because of the whole congestion and conjunction up there. But that's about all I have to say. Sound fine. Does the board have questions? Mr. Her. A uh, couple of <coughs> comments, well, perhaps maybe a question or two. So uh, my mom and dad are from Ireland, mm -hmm. and uh, I grew up in an Irish household. And two funny things, at least for me anyway, I never heard their accent until I came home from college. I came home from college one day, and like, my mother was yelling at me about something. And I'm like, oh my god, you have an accent. <laughs> when you grow up in the house, and you're surrounded by all these American people, and you're, you know, the Irish, it just didn't come out. It's a very strange thing for me. Anyway, that's one. Two, I must have been told by my father a thousand times in my life growing up, that's poppycock. So I'm familiar with that expression as well. Uh, I think this is a great idea for Hopkinton. Uh, I think it's a great uh, opportunity for Hopkinton to put a little bit more energy into downtown Hopkinton, and I fully support it. Not because he's from Ireland, but because um, I just think the energy that he's talking about creating is very doable, and I think it's going to be very doable in a responsible way. So I've known CJ for quite a while. Um, if anybody doesn't know him, he's about as straight of a shooter as you're going to get. He could care less who you are, what you're talking about. His opinion is coming at you. Uh, and he's been nothing but a stand-up guy through this whole process <clears throat> from, uh, you know, he's a tough negotiator. I know that I've tried to negotiate a few tabs here and there and <laughs> didn't go, didn't get very far. Um, but came in and and uh, like the last time he was here, I had to go home and look up. When he was talking about shillings, I thought he was talking about a pitcher for the Red Sox. <laughs> <laughs> um, but seriously, CJ is just what I think that the, the center of town needs. He's, he's energetic, he's vibrant, he's, he's, he's a forward thinker, and he's putting his heart and soul into this. So I, I back CJ a thousand percent. He's done a wonderful job as a, as a business owner. He's done a good job. Um, I, I, he's just a, a, a solid guy, and I back him. Okay. Well, I'm gonna switch from being the usual nice guy, I'm going to do, pull the Mr. Her part about this. You're going to be getting a liquor license, Maybe. and I know that you've you've you're at bills all the time, so you're mm -hmm. you're very good at it, and and you've been you've been trained. Um, but just keep that in mind that that sure. you're going from a coffee shop to having a liquor license, mm -hmm. and all of the all those the issues that come up with it. This is a, I, was, I thought that was going to be one of your comments. You say I got that one. And they said, oh, he's going to get that one. That's, that's, that's after great. we close the public hearing. Ah. Okay. But anyway, yeah, and, you, and you, you, you've done a great job, and you really do put your heart and soul into Thank the place, you. and that, and it's just so great to see um, the, the whole downtown coming alive, you know, and with uh, the, 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 the houses getting all redone and the revitalization of downtown, and you're a big part of it. So thank you very much. And thank you. So when I saw that this, uh, when I saw this agenda item, I texted my wife, and she was overjoyed, as was I, <laughs> to know that we we're gonna be able to go downtown. We're not gonna have to go to Worcester, Framingham, what, right in our own town. We can go get tapas and a glass of wine. That sounds, uh, sounds fabulous, so. Thank you. Judging by what I've just said, obviously, yes, I'm fully supportive of it. Um, I think uh, the revitalization of downtown, and just giving us a place to go, um, giving adults an activity would be great. Thank you. No, this sounds like a lot of fun. Uh, I think it brings a nice uh, new element of vitality into the downtown. Uh, I think we've all been concerned for a long time about keeping downtown alive. Uh, and this is just the kind of thing we need to bring to bring more vitality, more interest, more places to go. Um, I certainly believe that whatever other entities come into town, uh, I, think they f I think you fill a different niche than they do, so I think there's room for everybody. Um, and you know, I think it's, it, you, 
it's not a surprise to you that you have a strong amount of community support. I will tell you that since this came out on the agenda, uh, this board has received quite a few letters from supporters saying, you know, please support this, it's a wonderful business. Um, and that, that really, really speaks well to you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I, I did, in reading all the permitting team comments and the, and the preparatory materials, there was one of our public safety officials addressed the need for crowd management. Julia, you both got the TIP certification, uh, the, the need for the crowd management certificate, yep, which I was, I guess, available online. Yep. Um, and, you know, Julia wrote, was right there, right away, bing, I got it, you know, I did it, which is great. Um, and, and to that point, I think the only thing I, I would suggest is, um, you know, that CJ, if you haven't done it, that I you do that yeah, too. Yeah, 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 uh, she can't always be a one man band on. <laughs> she is. It doesn't quite She's cut it for, as, a bounce, <laughs> as a bouncer, but maybe, I don't know. Ah, <laughs> so I'm, I'm glad you had that too. Uh, that Thank was you. my only my only concern other than that. Uh, you know, I just think it's a great, a great uh, new adventure. So um, are there other public comments before we close the public hearing? Are there comments from the public? Yes, please come up to the microphone. Mm -hmm. Give us your name and address. Maureen Camalucci to Woodland Road, Maureen. and uh, I too come from an Irish background, married an Italian, <laughs> but I'm um, straightforward too, and I just want to get my two cents out there, and it's going to be probably as useful as an ashtray on a motorcycle, but um, I'm just a little concerned about the amount of um, just, just the alcohol uh, in town. Um, I think just from reading posts that I've read, it was just the, the consensus was mimosas and uh, Bloody Marys and all that, and uh, it's all fine and dandy, but I'm more concerned with um, how we get the 21 something. They're just newly getting there, um, you know, learning about alcohol, and they're gonna play grown up, and they're gonna go to these places, and they're gonna be, you know, drinking a little bit too much, and oh, I can have a, you know, mimosa with my breakfast, and oh, let's have a wine with lunch. They're gonna play mom and dad, and, um, you know, I, I'm just concerned about that. I think that with the um, the concern of, of all the addiction going on, not just opioid, everything, I think, I personally think it's a gateway. Um, and, you know, that's, I guess, my two cents. I'm, I just my concern and the direction, and I think there's four places now with that central central um, house there and next to a yogurt place where kids hang out. I, I just, that's my concern, my two cents, and, you know, that's it. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, Mr. Uh, uh, thank you for your uh, comments, and, and, and they're very valid. But there is a program in place in Massachusetts and in most states, um, responsible al alcohol management program. And you know, we have spent a lot of time, Julia and I, over the last couple of weeks, putting together our program uh, to train our staff in. Um, as a bartender here in town and been in the business for 25 years, you know, there are those people who try to overstep the line. But um, I will. You know, there'll be zero tolerance of any abuse of alcohol at Bittersweet. Um, it's just, you know, I've seen the damage it can do to families and to communities also, and uh, I think we have to dispense it responsibly. I think we have to take uh, responsibility for our actions if we don't, and uh, I think you're very valid you know, points. I think it, it's, a, it's a, an interesting one too, to, because there is a fine line, but you can rest assured that I'll do my very best to keep us responsible and um, you know, hopefully, ever you, you, you know, you have my word on that. I do it at bills. I don't let anybody away with anything, and I think I'm admired for it because um, I do see it. Um, it can lead to problems. Other public comment? Yes. Hi, I'm Stacia Peter Cresi, I'm at Seven Lilac Court. Um, I just wanted to just briefly give my support. I think that Bittersweet is a great and unique place in our in our town. I think that their mm -hmm. idea to turn into a tapas restaurant is a fabulous idea. I think it will serve the town well, and um, I look forward to an opportunity to be there. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Any other board questions or comments? I'd like, uh, I'd like to make a motion to close the public hearing. All right. Is there second. a second? Motion has been made and seconded to close the public hearing. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 And opposed. It is unanimous. The public hearing is now closed. Um, is there board deliberation? 
Madam Chair, in the interest of time, I'll make the motion and then we can deliberate after the second okay. if there is a second. I move that the Board of Selectmen approve a Section 12 Walt and Wine and Malt Liquor License. Well, let me back up. I move that the Board of Selectmen approve a Section 12 Wine and Malt License for Bittersweet at 28 Main Street and to approve Julia Kersas Curtis. as manager and move that the Board of Selectmen approve the entertainment license as requested. Second. All right, discussion. Hearing none, um, the motion has been made and seconded. All those in favor, uh, please signify by saying aye. 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 And opposed, that is unanimous. Thank you so much Thank for your you. time. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Thank you. We are right on schedule for 8 o'clock and next on our agenda is Hopkinton Donuts LLC doing business as Dunkin Donuts 78 West Main Street a new common vitular license the Board of Selectmen will consider a common vitular license application from Steve Sardina of Hopkinton Donuts LLC doing business as Dunkin Donuts for a coffee shop at 78 West Main Street. Hours of operation are seven days a week, 4.30 a.m. to 12 midnight. Mr. Sardina. Hi, good evening. Welcome. Good Actually, evening. my name is Manny Ferreira, so I'm here in oh, place of Stephen yes. Sardina. Yes, yes. Mr. Ferreira. How are you? Fine, thank you. Would you like to tell us a little about uh, about the plan? You're about set to open, I understand. We're very, very close, uh, probably a few more weeks before we're up and ready um, to open the store. Um, so basically for tonight, it's just kind of move forward and be able to get our common fixtures license um, so that we can start getting everything lined up so that we can open. Goal is end of next week to have everything ready. Are there questions on the part of the board for Mr. Ferreira? So, um, so as a point of clarification, perhaps for some, and maybe even for myself, so the entity that's at the gas station now is is, Hopkinton has Hopkinton. a license, a lecture yeah. license, and that license basically is going to close, and then we're going to open a new license at the new place. So you guys didn't go spend $3 million on this building without expecting that this license is going to be granted, right? So because right. you already had a license, there's the logic in this whole thing. Mm -hmm. Um, I was a little surprised that, you know, but then it made sense. So I have no other questions. I think it's all good. I have a question. Is your, is this a place that's going to actually be making donuts there or is it? No, it's going to be brought in. Okay. So kind of dovetailing on, on Brian's question is we're, we're closing out the old and opening in this, is it so basically, it's a different entity. Uh, we're going from a Hopkinton Donuts Inc., which is what we are at the gas station, okay. to an LLC. Okay. And um, is there a reason behind that, or just for no. corporate reasons, organization purposes? Mm -hmm. Okay. I'm all set. No further questions. Um, may I will entertain one comment from the public, Ms. Roman, Ms. Dr. Roman. Hi, Margot Roman, 72 West Main Street, Nate Westcopter. It's been really traumatizing to have Dunkin' Donuts being put down next to us. Besides their, um, their the way that they've treated the neighbors, and since none of the neighbors had wanted it to begin with, and then they went ahead and proceeded to cut all the trees down that shaded part of my property, the roots that were on my property. And it was pretty upsetting the first time they did it. And the second time they did it, it was really not nice. And there were trees that were coming back and were giving us shade. You know, we have animals that are really injured badly and they need to stay in the cars while we go out. There's no shade on my property. And they basically were like, well, we don't give a F about it. You know, we're cutting our trees down. 
that's not the kind of neighbor that we want in town. Um, and again, I don't know if any of the, I mean, the building is beautiful. Why couldn't it have been a solar building? Why couldn't they have put in solar awnings or something to put, to do something to give some value to that property? And the, you know, we talk about bittersweet. At least there's food there that people can eat that is healthy. There's really nothing at Dunkin' Donuts that is good for anyone to be running on. So I look at it and I look out the window of my clinic and everyone's right. running for Duncan and they're getting diabetes and obesity and, and all these other illnesses. But it's the part of it is that nobody wanted it next to us and then they cut all my trees down. So I'm just wanting to speak my voice um, and let you guys know that I'm very unhappy about them being next door and I'm not embracing that at all. Okay, thank you. Um, I, I hope everyone will understand what the jurisdiction of this board is. Um, I know there have been ongoing concerns amongst various members of the public over this, this enterprise. Um, it has gone through the appropriate uh, site plan review and received its appropriate permits. Uh, its litigation has been resolved, and what is coming before us this evening is simply the, uh, the final stage to allow their opening. Um, we are not in a position, uh, unfortunately, to address the concerns raised, um, legitimate or, or worthwhile as they may be. So I hope everyone understands um, what we are here to do this evening. And, Madam and Chair, I move that the Board of Selectmen approve a common victory license for Dunkin' Donuts at 78 West Main Street. Okay, is there a second? Second. Okay, that motion has been made and seconded. Uh, in the absence of further board questions, um, all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 And opposed, that is unanimous. Okay. I appreciate it, thank you. Thank you, sir. Have a good night. Okay. Uh, we have a public hearing that is scheduled for 8.30, and uh, we are not able to take that hearing any earlier than 8.30. So it being 8.06, uh, I will ask the town manager to see if he can perhaps uh, address for us a number of the items that are on the town manager's report. Mr. Kamalo, could you, uh, I know we've already discussed um, the DPW update when Mr. Mm -hmm. Westerling was here. Uh, would you like to raise some of the others? Yes. Um, through the chair, I will begin with the KIF Regional Tech School Regional Agreement. Um, as, as, as you may have seen from some of the emails we have, re we, we have received, um, the school is in the process of revising the regional agreement with the area towns. Uh, the need for this revision is driven by the change in government in Framingham and the new manner in which the Kif Tech representative in that town will be selected. Uh, while making this uh, adjustment, uh, Kif Tech has also updated some of the areas that have become outdated since the last revision in 1987 to better reflect current practices. Uh, to that end, I, I wanted to put this document in the board's hands so that you have adequate time to review it. And if there are any other observations that you've made over the past years that you'd like reflected in these changes, I would like to get those to Ray. And Ray then can uh, discuss with the council who is in fact helping KIFTEC revise this agreement. And so the, the purpose of this discussion today is to simply uh, put the agreement in your hands, give you time to review it. We are also consulting internally among staff as well as with town council to compile the other town comments that may be necessary. Um, I did look over the document and um, if it is a draft and it's still open for some comment, um, in the section that references the school committees, it makes a blanket statement that all communities are now uh, appointing their school committees rather than electing, which of course is not the case in Hopkinton. Our school committee is still elected. Um, when I read the substance of the paragraph and, and you know what it proposed, it doesn't operationally really make any difference. But just in terms of accuracy, uh, every community under that agreement does not appoint 
their school committee. Hopkinton still elects there, so perhaps point taken, uh, you, you can mention that to them and, and have that accommodated in some way, so it's accurate. It's the only thing I had. Yeah, um, specifically at this point, we're not looking for a motion. Again, in terms of process, we're seeking comments, observations, suggestions from the board. Um, we want to get to some, um, some final revision uh, before the town sets its town meeting warrant. Mm -hmm. uh, the reason being, this document will have to go through the town meeting process. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah. that's all I noted. Anything from other members? I'm fine with Ray's oversight of this process. Well, sounds like we have a little bit of time. You can go home and look at it again. Yeah. Bedtime reading, something yeah. pops up, let him know, okay. Okay. Uh, OPEP? OPEP. Uh, this is the final step uh, in relation to action that was approved at town meeting uh, in 2018, where town meeting authorized the creation of a trust to oversee the other post-employment benefits uh, funds that the town has um, created uh, and invested in over the uh, past three or four years. Um, the document is before the board for final approval and signature. It has been reviewed by town council. Uh, in fact, it was drafted by town council and uh, he's recommending approval. Excellent. Excellent. Okay, so, and, and is that in the packet here for us to sign tonight? Yes. Okay. All right. We'll so would a motion be in order? Yes, please. Okay. So I move that the board execute the town of Hopkins and other post-employment benefits trust agreement as presented to the board and as authorized by town meeting's vote under Article 13 of the annual town meeting of May 7th, 2018. Is there a second? Second. All right, the motion has been made and seconded. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 And opposed, and that is unanimous. Okay, and I think Despite what it says on our agenda, Mr. Kamala, you said the Trails Committee update will be held for another date? Yes, please. Okay. Oh, okay. Just yeah. Okay. okay. We're going to hold off on that. Um, so we still... Mm -hmm. Mr. Kamal. With your permission. Please. Um, I do have a document that I want to share with the board regarding the FY20 budget process. Okay. Um, I think the key highlight here, Mr. Chair, The key highlight being um, at the next Board of Selection meeting, September 25th, the town manager will be seeking consensus on the budget timeline, which I'm sharing with you in draft form uh, today. Uh, we will be inviting uh, the Appropriations Committee as well as the School Committee to that discussion. Uh, simultaneously, we'll be asking the Board of Selectmen to issue a budget message establishing the general budget guidelines. I think what is important to uh, highlight is the fact that when the board was going through the FY19 budget process leading to town meeting, uh, towards the end of the budget review process, you asked us to consult with the key departments in town, including the school department, uh, seeking projections. Mm. Uh, and I believe at that point, uh, we received three to five year projections. Mm -hmm. And my suggestion is that those projections perhaps should be the starting point for developing and discussing the budget message for FY20. Mm -hmm. uh, we were also working with the we're also working with the finance department uh, to at least start the capital plan planning process uh, in advance of what we have normally done in the past. Uh, I have asked the interim finance director to distribute the capital article materials uh, by September 12th. September 12th? It's tomorrow. That's tomorrow. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Madam Chair. Mm -hmm. Mr. Herm. So, Mr. Kamalo, this is uh, well organized and I like the flow. Uh, have the dates been bounced off our colleagues on the school committee yet or is that gonna happen soon? Did you mention that? Yeah, we've, we've discussed the dates internally with the superintendent and the school business manager. Uh, the Board of Selectmen Chair 
uh, and the school committee chair, together with the superintendent and the town manager, are scheduled to meet this week, and we'll be and this discussing. Will be on the tape. Yes. Mm -hmm. okay. mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, I, I certainly agree to using those projections from last year as a starting point. I'm assuming that the school committee will be giving us further input. I know talking with some of them just recently, it seems like it may be that even those projections need some revisions, um, that some of their numbers are coming in very high. So if, you know, I think it's important that we, starting the process, we, we start it from the right starting point. Uh, correct. That may be different. Yes, correct. And in fact, uh, I've also had some discussions with the school superintendent. She has shared the latest projections, uh, and the numbers do require and warrant uh, further discussion between the town boards. Yeah. Yeah. So that'll, that'll influence what the starting point is. Yeah. Okay. Okay. All right. Um, well, thank you for that for that update. And uh, we do have time to address the liaison reports, if there are any, from the board members. I have one. Mr. Ted Stone. Marathon School is open. <laughs> My work is done. <laughs> yep. <laughs> no. Please take me so off. So that, that committee is still ongoing. Um, but it had a, a very, very successful opening and uh, no issues, no complaints, couple of complaints on traffic that day, but um, it is open and uh, there's probably not a happier employee in the town of Hopkins than Lauren DeBow these days, so. And, and a sadder employee than Dave Del Torrio who's getting center school turned over to yeah. him. <laughs> Any others from anyone here? Uh, in following that, in, in that vein anyway, the fields at the school complex are almost open. Great. Uh, they're looking at October 1 to wrap it up and actually have kids practicing on the field. So it will be this fall. Uh, weather's not going to be a big deal anymore. We get to get out in that field no matter what, or those fields. So they're on schedule and ready for uh, practice this fall, and use this fall for games as well, for whatever sports you're playing. Excellent. Uh, just another quick thought on liaison while we have a couple of minutes here. Mm -hmm. I was approached recently in the community by somebody, a very active member of our community uh, in local government and the com community as a whole, and, and there was some frustration and concern um, about liaison assignments and members of the board not attending mm -hmm. meetings. Um, and as we've talked about every year when we get to uh, pick these liaison positions, uh, we talk about it then during our meeting. I had the same conversation with this person uh, that day, and I said, well, did you call the member that you're frustrated with? And he said, well, no, they're the liaison. They're supposed to be there. I said, no, they're not. And he said, what do you mean? And I explained the process and the concept of liaison. And he's like, oh, well, I didn't understand that, neither did my committee. So the whole committee was frustrated that somebody wasn't showing up, but the person shouldn't have been showing up because they weren't asked to show up. Right. So the liaison position is a position that we're available. If called to, we will attend and coordinate and facilitate discussion with this board. But it's not a voting position on the committee. It's not a, a, a requirement that we attend the meetings because we'd be going to meetings seven times a day and three right. times on Saturday. Right. It just won't. It's just physically not possible with all the different assignments we have. So. If people are looking for their Board of Selectmen liaison to attend a public meeting for the committee or whatever they're on, please contact us because we're not just assuming uh, you know, what's going on there. Yeah, yeah. Just want to reaffirm that because yeah. I literally just had about a half hour discussion yeah. with somebody about yeah. this uh, not a week ago. And, and to your point, Mr. Herr, mm -hmm. I think there's a fine line, it's a bit of a judgment call. As to how deeply a, a, a selectman liaison can or should get involved in the intricate workings of a committee, whether it's in their individual projects or, or um, if there's something that this board can help with or help facilitate something, but I, I don't, I've never felt the liaison is supposed to start getting, getting involved in the, in the operations of the board. That that is for their chairman and their board members. Mm -hmm. And so, 
And I was asked yeah. by friends of Hopkinton to remind everybody that Hopkinton Day is this coming Saturday, along with Poly Arts, and um, it's also celebrating Brendan's birthday and my birthday this weekend. But that's a whole nother thing. <laughs> that's a whole nother thing. But no, shameless. but it's it's <laughs> it's a shameless plug. It's uh, you know, Hopkinton Day. It's 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 something that we started again last year, and the uh, fireworks display is. Again, we're hoping for good weather, and it's uh, it's another spectacular sight. And it's, it, it's something to behold and not to be missed. Great, great. And will you be in the dunk tank at all this year? Yeah, yeah. Well, I'm going right, right before, right after you. You're going after me. The water might be warm. Give <laughs> 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 okay. me another recess, please. <laughs> Israel, any any reports or anything you want to share? Top that. <laughs> Top, <laughs> Top that. that. Okay. I just I sent for text. That. You'll defer. Okay. I, <laughs> I have a couple a couple things to say here. Uh, reporting on the Center School Reuse Committee, they are wrapping up their work. Uh, we should expect to be seeing them before this board very soon, uh, presenting their findings and uh, what has come from various town uh, surveys and input from the different boards and committees for uh, suggested reuse for the very much loved center school. Uh, they have uh, engaged services of a design professional to do some rough, uh, rough just a rough look at possible design, possible costs for uh, Reuse to meet various town needs. So we shall be we shall be hearing from them very soon. And uh, on that note, also I will say, in addition to Family Day and um, and Poly Arts, the Center School is having the Center School farewell on the same day uh, on September fifteenth. There will be a ceremony starting at the school, I believe, at two o'clock, with a handing over of the key. No, Nancy's. Uh, 12, I'm sorry, it's uh, between 12 and 2, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, it starts at 12. I think it will go on till 2. There are tours of the school, a slideshow, but the 2, two o'clock was the end date, right? Yes. Am I imagining that? It starts that? at 11, it goes till 2, okay. and then the ceremony's at noon. Okay, I knew I wasn't imagining two o'clock. It was something. It was coming from somewhere. So if you're up for poly arts, uh, don't miss your opportunity to say goodbye to Center School. Have a nice tour. They're going to have a slideshow, and uh, lots of good things happening. Take one last uh, spin on the swings out back. So, <laughs> so um, are there any future agenda board board items that the board would like to uh, raise? Um, I'd like to have, uh, <clears throat> if I could bring uh, John Wesseling back in to speak about um, the master plan for DPW and see where a um, tree wood might fit in because we keep getting inqu inquiries on that. Mm -hmm. yep. I thought we'd already delegated that to town staff to figure out. Yeah. Okay, well, we'll get a report on it. Okay. Okay. And I, I have mentioned before, I, I don't want to let discussion of trails go. Uh, we need to have a broader ranging look at where trails are planned, how the process works. Um, get them some money. So make sure that neighbors neighbors have uh, some voice in the process. Perhaps even a, a even a master plan would be good to have. So I, I citizens have been promised that, and I. I want to make sure we, we don't drop it. <coughs> so, um, seeing nothing else, uh, it is 8:23, and the public hearing is scheduled for 8:30, and we need to wait until then. So we will take a short recess unless Madam the board Chair, members miss Mr. Hur something it, else. Would it be possible, and would, would it make sense for us yeah, to take a couple of minutes before the public hearing begins to explain how the public hearing is going to work and how it's going to flow? So that there's no confusion uh, about how this needs to happen. Sometimes when we get very emotionally charged issues before us and people are not familiar with the public hearing process, it gets a little uh, confusing. So I would suggest that we take a couple of minutes and just walk through 
This is what we're going to do first. This is what we're going to do second. This is what we're going to do third. This is what we're going to open comments. We're going to close comments, etc. Otherwise, this could quickly, in my opinion or my experience, get a little out of control, and I'd rather it not. Okay. Well, um, if if you wish, uh, I, I do have a prepared statement that I will will read, which lays this out when we begin the public hearing. Oh, okay, great. But but in general, so people understand. Um, uh, I have a statement that I will read on behalf of, of the board. Um, we will, much of this information, as you know, has received a lot of attention. It, uh, we've been looking at this situation for close to 20 months. Um, much of the information is all in the public domain. And so we are certainly not going to be going into every last detail of, uh, of, of the matter this evening. Um, we're going to touch on the pertinent points and have representative sampling of, of witnesses and commentary. Um, the uh, So Madam Chair, perhaps that, I think that should be saved for the opening of the public hearing. It is hearing. going so to be if saved. If I could take two minutes and just from my perspective anyway, having run a gazillion of these over the years. Okay. So this is how it works. We're going to open the public hearing. Okay, and if I'm boring anybody with this, we've got five minutes, so hang in there. We can't do anything else anyway. <coughs> um, we're going to open the public hearing, okay, and there's going to be some people coming before us, sitting in front of us here with, uh, with the organization Greyhound Friends, as I understand it, and Mr. Marys or Mr. Kamal, tell me when I'm saying something wrong here. Don't worry. They're going to make... Uh, <laughs> They're going to make some comments. They're going to they're going to present their situation. They're going to present their argument. They're going to present their uh, thoughts on the whole matter, etc. They're going to make their request. You know, we're going to discuss what the request the request is they have in front of the board of selectmen tonight. So they'll talk for a while. Then the board of selectmen may have some questions and interact with them talking for a while, and we'll get to a point where we're all sort of okay with what has been discussed so far. And in a public hearing, it is just that. Then we go out to the public. And the public has an opportunity to come to the microphone, give us your name and address, and state what it is you want to state specific to the issue. You can't go on for 10 minutes at the microphone. Okay, You need to make your point and have a seat so others can come to the microphone. And we'll do the public hearing process, just like a town meeting, until we've heard both sides of the issue fairly well. Okay, It's pretty clear what the sides of the issue are, for, uh, are, are in this case. So I don't think it's going to take two hours to figure out what both sides of the issue are. Okay, and then at some point, one of the members of the Board of Selectmen, likely the bad guy sitting right here, is going to vote to close the public hearing because we've heard enough, because we've heard both sides. Okay, and then once we vote to close the public hearing, that's it. The public hearing part is over. We're done listening to the public, and we come back to deliberation at the board level. Mm -hmm. And then the board will deliberate, and if the board decides to have a motion in front of it and make a decision, and that's what the board will do at that time. That's the process we follow. At times in Hopkinton over the years, some of these public hearings have gotten out of control. We have our friends here tonight from the fire department and from the police department to help us keep this thing in control. If anybody gets out of control, the chair has the right and the responsibility and the authority to ask that individual to be escorted out of the room. I don't mean to say that in a threatening way, but there have been times in the past when that has had to happen. So we hope tonight that's not the case. And I just thank you, Mr. Ms. Madam Chair, for letting me say all that. I think it helps set the expectations, and any member of the board, if they get frustrated with what's going on in the audience, can do some things up here to stop what's going on out there. So please, if everyone cooperates, this is going to be a great hearing, and we're going to figure this thing out. But if it gets out of control, I think a lot of people are going to get very frustrated very fast. Thank you, Mrs. Chair, Madam Chair. Thank you, Mr. Herr. Backstage. 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 Backstage.
Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's what she put in backstage. Well, she didn't know the password. Backstage is the name of the <laughs> Mr. Catino, when I said warm water, I meant that it's going to be supposed to be a very warm day that day. Yeah. Of course, there was any implication oh, it's, it's otherwise. It's <laughs> if there was any implication otherwise, it's misconstrued. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, being 8:30. Ladies and gentlemen, it being 8.30, um, I now will open the public hearing, a motion to open the public hearing uh, on the Greyhound Friends Incorporated. So moved. Second. Second. All those in favor of opening the public hearing, please say aye. 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 Okay. The next matter on the board's agenda for tonight is to conduct a hearing relative to the Greyhound Friends Incorporated Dog Kennel at 167 Saddle Hill Road to assist the Board of Selectmen in making a determination whether the kennel has been maintained in a sanitary and humane manner, if records have been properly kept as required by law, and if the Board supports the issuance of a new kennel license for the facility. All town kennel licenses are issued on an annual basis with an expiration date of March 31st. The last time Greyhound Friends possessed a kennel license was 2017. That license was issued in January 2017. On January 20th, 2017, the Mass Department of Agricultural Resources issued a cease and desist order to Greyhound Friends, prohibiting that organization from importing any dogs or cats into the Commonwealth until necessary improvements were made to the facility. This cease and desist order was based on several inspections that the department conducted. Those inspection reports and the cease and desist order will be entered into the record of this hearing later in this proceeding. On February 6th, 2017, the Hoppington Animal Control Officer sent a letter to Greyhound Friends informing the kennel that its kennel license had been suspended until such time that it rectified the violations described in the department's order. In response to these actions, the Board of Selectmen scheduled a kennel license revocation hearing to discuss Greyhound Friends' 2017 kennel license. However, by letter dated March 24, 2017, Greyhound Friends requested that the Board postpone any hearing on the 2017 kennel license indefinitely while the organization undertook renovations to the kennel. Since that time, Greyhound Friends' kennel license expired. Greyhound Friends does not currently have a kennel license and has not been operating the kennel since 2017. Greyhound Friends applied to the town clerk for a new kennel license on June 7, 2018. The Massachusetts General Laws and the Hopkinton Town Bylaws provide that when a kennel license application is received, the town clerk will request that the animal control officer or his designee conduct an inspection of the kennel, including its records, and if the kennel passes inspection, the town clerk is required to issue the license. However, once a license is issued, the Board of Selectmen may be called upon to hold a hearing to determine whether that license should be suspended or revoked. This determination would, make upon, would be made upon an inspection of the facility and its records and would be based on whether the kennel is being maintained in a sanitary and humane manner and whether records are properly kept as required by law. 
Rather than potentially go through this two-step process, Greyhound Friends elected to submit its new kennel license application along with a request that the town clerk take no action on the application until the Board of Selectmen could hold a hearing to determine whether the kennel is being maintained in a sanitary and humane manner and if records have been properly kept as required by law. The Hopkinton bylaw contains the following definitions of the term humane and sanitary. Humane, provision of proper food and water, shelter or protection from the weather, veterinary attention needed to reduce or end suffering from disease or injury, a sanitary environment, facilities which are of sufficient size and design as to allow the animal to stand, sit, lie down, turn around, and make other normal postural adjustments without obstruction, interference, or impediment by the presence of food, water bowls, equipment, or other animals, have an appropriate ambient temperature, and the absence of inhumane treatment. Inhumane treatment shall include willfully permitting an animal to be subjected to unnecessary torture, suffering, or cruelty, to subject, cause, or procure an animal to be tortured or tormented, to be cruelly killed, beaten, or mutilated, ineffective measures to prevent the infestation of animals and premises by parasites, insects, or vermin, and to be subjected to cruel and humane chaining or tethering at any time, which shall include filthy and dirty confinement conditions, including but not limited to, one, exposure to excessive animal waste, garbage, dirty water, noxious odors, dangerous objects that could injure or kill a dog upon contact or other circumstances that could cause harm to a dog's physical or emotional health. Two. Taunting, prodding, hitting, harassing, threatening, or otherwise harming a tethered or confined dog. And three, subjecting a dog to dangerous conditions, including attacks by other animals. Sanitary. Conditions which include the interior and exterior floors and all animal contact areas which are smooth, impervious to water, and are cleaned and sanitized as often as necessary to maintain sanitary conditions and free of animal wastes, provided that outdoor areas may have a floor of animal-appropriate gravel, which is maintained and cleaned on a regular schedule consistent with the maintenance of sanitary conditions and facilities which are maintained in good repair and kept clean at all times so as to protect animals from disease and injury. Additionally, Section 67, 62-7 DB of the town bylaw requires that the following information be maintained at a kennel and made available for inspection. One, name and address of the owner of each dog kept in the kennel other than dogs belonging to the person maintaining the kennel. Two, the name and address of persons who have purchased dogs from the kennel. Three, staff training records and materials. Four, all contracts for goods or services provided in connection with the kennel's operation. And five, organizational policies relating to animal care, intake, veterinary treatment, adoption, and euthanasia. On September 6, 2018, the animal control officer caused an inspection to be conducted on the Greyhound Friends Kennel by Hopkinton Police Lieutenant Joseph Bennett, Hopkinton Police Chiefs Edward Lee, Hopkinton Fire Prevention Officer Thomas Poirier and Timothy Healy, Hopkinton Public Health Director Inspector Sean McAuliffe, and Hopkinton Director of Municipal Inspections Charles Cadlick. This inspection continued on September 11, 2018, when Lieutenant Bennett received Greyhound Friends records with the assistance of Linda Harrod, Animal Inspector for the Massachusetts Department of Agricultural Resources. Details of that inspection are documented in an inspection report that will be introduced into the record as part of this hearing. The Board is keenly aware and mindful of the fact that the treatment of animals is a sensitive topic that many people feel very passionately about. With that in mind, the Board will conduct this hearing according to a strict structure, with the goal of providing all parties an opportunity to present information relevant to the determination at hand, specifically whether the kennel is being maintained in a sanitary and humane manner 
and if records have been properly kept as required by law. Immediately after these opening remarks, I will ask Greyhound Friends to make a five-minute presentation to the board. After that, I will ask Lieutenant Bennett to present the most recent inspection report from September 6, 2018. I will then enter a number of relevant documents into the record. Once these documents are in the record, I will ask Greyhound Friends to take 10 minutes to present any witnesses it has invited to the hearing. I will then provide 10 minutes for witnesses in opposition to the licensure who have previously indicated that they have specific knowledge that is relevant to the board. Next, I will allow public comment for 20 minutes. During the public comment period, I will ask those speaking in favor of the licensure of Greyhound Friends to form one line and those opposed to form another. I will then allow commenters from the two lines to take turns offering comments to the board. After the public comment period is over, I will invite board members to ask questions to Greyhound Friends and the witnesses and commenters. I will then entertain a motion to close the hearing and the board will deliberate before voting. At this point, I'm going to ask Greyhound Friends attorney, Elizabeth Reinhardt, to make a five minute presentation to the board. Madam Chair, before you go forward, I'm struggling with that last sentence or two that you had in your document there, or I think you said something to the effect that members of the board would ask questions of the audience that gave public comment. I do not think we should get into a public debate back and forth with people at a public <coughs> hearing. So I'm okay with, I think that's a great document and everything you've outlined is perfect. That last piece though, I, did, I don't think that's gonna be healthy for anybody if we get into a debate with somebody that came to the microphone for or against. I, if, if I may, I don't think that was what was Can intended. I, I, think it, it, I think the intent is that we ask questions of the, of the professional testimony. Yeah. Okay, so it's not the, the no. individuals. No. no. It's General, a not, not a public debate. There are there are witnesses on both sides who are who will offer professional testimony. Okay, that's before, it. Before before the public comment period, Ms. Reinhardt, welcome. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman. It's a pleasure to be here with you this evening. The first thing to say is thank you for this opportunity on behalf of Greyhound Friends. We appreciate the opportunity to give you a current in-person update about events at the kennel since it closed in. January 2017. My role is to give you a legal status update. The first thing to say about the legal status of Greyhound Friends is that it was created in 1983, incorporated in 1985, and is a Massachusetts charitable nonprofit corporation. It is also recognized by the IRS as an exempt 501c3 public charity. As a result, it is accountable to both of those agencies. It historically has been and continues to be in compliance with those agencies' regulatory requirements. Any animal shelter or other nonprofit who's been in operation for 35 years faces challenges, as did Greyhound Friends beginning in the fall of 2016 when the Division of Public Charities initiated a review of certain of its financial records. A cease and desist order issued by the Massachusetts Department of Agricultural Resources, or the MDAR, followed on January 20th, 2017, prohibiting the use of the kennel's isolation unit and thus the ability to bring new dogs in from outside Massachusetts for adoption. Suspension of the Hopkinton kennel license, as you mentioned, followed on January 23rd in 2017, and a criminal complaint for animal cruelty against founder Louise Coleman personally was filed in the Framingham District Court in March of 2017. As you'll hear this evening, after two years of internal hard work and external cooperation in good faith with every legal and regulatory inquiry facing Greyhound Friends, this organization has transitioned from a founder-led organization to a stronger, autonomous public charity, now controlled and managed by a highly skilled, independent, mission-driven group of board members, staff, and volunteers. Founder Louise Coleman voluntarily resigned from Greyhound Friends from the Board of Directors in March of 2017. Her employment was terminated on May 15, 2017. 
Since that date, she has had no involvement in Greyhound Friends governance, management, or kennel operations, nor will she in the future. Last month, Greyhound Friends resolved all matters in the Attorney General's office with a governance agreement, in which Greyhound Friends confirms it will, and I quote, not appoint or employ founder Louise Coleman in any official capacity at Greyhound Friends, including as a director, corporate member, officer, employee or independent contractor, including in any role involving financial, operations, adoption, or kennel management, whether paid or unpaid. The governance agreement does contain a provision that, and I quote, Ms. Coleman may raise funds on Greyhound Friends' behalf in her individual capacity. Questions have been raised about the reference to Ms. Coleman's right to raise funds in her individual capacity. Despite recent history, Louise Coleman founded Greyhound Friends and in so doing created a highly successful nationally and internationally recognized animal rescue organization. Over the years, she developed many strong relationships with other advocates, experts, and donors here and abroad. She has First Amendment rights, as do we all. To the extent she wishes to encourage her network of friends and supporters to give to Greyhound Friends, Greyhound Friends is permitted to gratefully accept and acknowledge this support. What's important to understand, however, is that this is an external function approved by the Attorney General's Office. It will not result in any role or other involvement with Greyhound Friends for Ms. Coleman. The Attorney General's Governance Agreement, which you have in your materials, also acknowledges a number of voluntary governance <coughs> improvements, as well as certain obligations, including, for example, follow-up financial reporting. No fines, penalties, or other financial payments were assessed against Greyhound Friends, nor were any board members or officers removed as a result of that investigation. The Attorney General's press release, which is also in your materials, acknowledges Greyhound Friends' voluntary governance improvements, stating, this settlement establishes important guardrails to ensure that Greyhound Friends and its volunteer board are equipped to manage charitable assets going forward. It should be noted that Ms. Coleman resolved her personal case with the Attorney General separately, although the AG announced both in a single press release. The criminal matter against Ms. Coleman has also concluded. Greyhound Friends is, was not a party to this case, but it had involvement both in cooperatively providing hundreds of pages of dog records to the District Attorney's Office and through testimony of several Greyhound Friends representatives who were called as defense witnesses. You'll hear later this evening from Greyhound Friends Board of Directors President Stoddard Malhado. Mr. Malhado testified for the defense at the trial. There was also involvement at the trial by several of those present tonight to speak in opposition to Greyhound Friends license op application. Lieutenant Alan Borgall filed the compl criminal complaint against Ms. Coleman and testified for the prosecution, as did other opposition witnesses. Also, a number of the animal records to be entered into the record in this proceeding were also prosecution exhibits in the trial. After a four-day trial, at which 19 witnesses testified, on December 1, 2017, Ms. Coleman was declared not guilty. In announcing the not guilty verdict from the bench, Judge David Kunis said, and I quote, while there has been some evidence that Greyhound Friends could have improved the sanitary conditions at the shelter, there is also much credible evidence that the shelter was generally a safe and healthy environment for the dogs. This was a rescue shelter, and evidence showed that many of the dogs that arrived had already experienced much mistreatment and trauma in various other environments from which they came. It's clear to me that the defendant loved and cared for the dogs, and it is to be commended for making the rescue of these dogs her life's work. Although she may have taken her eye off the ball, so to speak, in terms of the physical upkeep of the kennel, this was indeed a regulatory issue that called for a regulatory solution. The evidence falls far short of establishing she had violated a criminal statute and committed a felony. Thus, I find her not guilty. Judge Kunis's comments regarding the condition of dogs coming into Greyhound Friends Rescue Shelter are important in tonight's context. Greyhound Friends is a unique organization. Please bring your comments to a close. I, there's a lot of status to report, and I'm going to move very quickly through you just are another page two and a half. It's over already. I'll be quick. 
The dog it accepts are essentially refugees, generally rendered homeless when tracks close or abandoned and then recovered. They sometimes come to the shelter with unknown medical or emotional needs. Allegations of mistreatment have been swirling in social media. Greyhound Friends has and does adamantly deny any dog was ever mistreated in its care. And I encourage you please to review the histories of 10 dogs in your materials as you further consider this issue. As Madam Chairman, you mentioned the cease and desist order relative to the isolation unit at the kennel is still in effect. Tonight, we hope to address and resolve any outstanding concerns related to Greyhound Friends' new application for licensing in Hopkinton. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Reinhardt. Next, I will ask Lieutenant Bennett to present the results of, the ins of his inspection of the facility and its records. Presentation of the inspection report. Lieutenant Bennett. I'd just like to start real briefly and um, say that the, the police department was tasked with doing a, an impartial, thorough, unbiased inspection of the kennel on Saddle Hill Road. Uh, I chose Lieutenant Bennett as the point man for this inspection, and I just want to commend him on the, the work he did assembling a team of other town departments. He's been extremely thorough, put in many, many hours uh, to complete this task, which is usually not his realm of <laughs> responsibilities but uh, I couldn't be prouder of his work. Thank you. <clears throat> Through you, Madam Chair, I'd like to uh, just take a moment to recognize the, both the people within the town that helped me with this task, as it is not something I'm familiar with, as well as the people that I worked with with Greyhound Friends, and the members of the board of directors, and Teresa, who have been uh, very helpful and welcoming through the process. And then from outside agencies, uh, Lieutenant Al Borland and um, Linda Harrod from the Mass Department of Agriculture were very helpful in this, uh, this task. Um, my report begins, which just was finished at 6 o'clock. These are the only, so I submit to you, Chief, the report for the first time. I have copies for everyone. I printed them and came here at 6.50 for the swearing in, and uh, th this was literally just completed. I apologize that it took so long, um, but it was very comprehensive. <clears throat> if you look at the report, it starts with a brief background, but you've covered all that. So I can go and I'll begin on uh, actual inspection day. And uh, I'll, I'll work my way through the, through the results, reading some and paraphrasing some. Um, so on September 6th, we arrived with the team from Hopkinton and those that you stated. And we were met by uh, Teresa Shepard and Kai and Stoddard Melhado, and we entered the building. Upon entry into the facility, it was immediately noticeable that there were no air conditioning present. Um, we moved through the, through the building as a team, and we stayed together in order to, uh, to uh, solicit input and feedback from uh, Greyhound Friends uh, staff that were on scene. <clears throat> Members of the fire department and the inspectional services and the Board of Health each made notes of the, the things that they they found, and those inspection uh, notes and concerns were identified, and I'll go through them quickly. Uh, uh, fire department re recognized that they need a copy of the most recent inspection report for the sprinkler system. They requested some signage be added um, near the sprinkler room. Uh, they asked for an FDC signing with four-inch lettering. Uh, they wanted the, the, fire, the fire extinguishers need to be inspected and advised on where they should be located. Um, storage was located up to the ceiling, which, it, which inhibits the fire suppression system. And they needed to obtain a permit for the compressed gases in the treatment room or remove them. Um, I know, and speaking with uh, Greyhound friends as recently as today, some of those things have been addressed or ordered and they're working through them. <clears throat> the inspectional services report um, just asked that they maintain life safety features such as the fire alarm suppression system, 
and fire extinguishers. Maintain the oil burner in safe working order and have it cleaned regularly and provide thermal breakdown at the pull down stairs. And the Board of Health noted that the hot water was found to be at 90 degrees. And I'll get into the hot water more as, as we move through it. So there was no failure. Um, these are recommendations and concerns, but those, those um, departments did not fail the inspection on either of any of those points. Uh, the, um, however, we'll go into it. My observations included uh, there was no air conditioning. Uh, the air conditioning in the kennel is, is not on a generator. Uh, as far as sanitation, there was no washing machine available on the site. No hot water was available for cleaning. The oil burner and domestic water heater system is not functioning due the, to at least the absence of heating oil, but we won't be able to confirm that till we, till it's fired up. The P-stone in the exterior areas is insufficient to allow for cleaning and sterilization. Um, the isolation, surgical, and general areas need separate cleaning and sterilization supplies. The isolation, surgical, and general areas need separate personal protection supplies. The exterior isolation area is not contained due to plastic panels being dislodged. The exterior isolation area concrete pad is not impervious to moisture. And I just noted in my report that these conditions are not consistent with Article 62 of the town bylaws, which Madam Chair, you've outlined as, as, as in the sanitary conditions that are necessary. Um, I again spoke with Greyhound Friends and some of these <coughs> items I've been told have been addressed for instance, the, the surface has been painted, um, but at my last, at, when I was in the building yesterday, it still didn't have heat or hot water. Uh, copies of the, I requested copies of the records of the 45 dogs that were in the presence uh, of the Greyhound Friends at the time of the Department of Agricultural Resources cease and desist and the Town of Hockington Kennel License Suspension. Operations Manager Teresa Shepard stated that 10 files were off-site. As she and Stoddard Mojado spoke, Stoddard offered to help assemble the files and stated that he had Herschel's files. This is not consistent with, with our uh, Hopkinton Town Bylaw Article 62, and it outlines what records must be kept and available at the facility at all times. Um, I know I spoke with uh, Operations Manager uh, Teresa Shepard, and on Monday I picked up the, the, uh, the, the packet of the 45 records as requested which she uh, gathered throughout the weekend. Um, the review of the records happened today with uh, Linda Harrod of the um, Massachusetts Department of Agricultural Resources. It, it took us over five hours to go through the records. Um, the review of the documents present showed the following. The documents are incomplete. They're missing dates, signatures, adoption contracts, surrender forms, foster contracts, and other, other aspects of the, uh, to maintain a complete file. We also are unable to account for two dogs, uh, Teriana and Jack, and Greyhound Friends recognizes that they are unable to account for Teriana at this time. Terry Shepard made that uh, available uh, right from the start. Um, I looked at the kennel size and capacity, which has been asked, and should, as part of a new kennel application to evaluate the size and capacity, and it's, I provided a diagram to help explain it, but uh, essentially there, are, I'll read it because I, I tried to explain it a few times and this is the best explanation I could come up for the physical layout of the kennel in words. There are 10 kennels in the main kennel area made up of two sections divided by a guillotine door. On the diagram I've labeled them C1 and 2. The overall dimensions are 30.5 by 146.5 inches. There are also 10 other kennel spaces in the main kennel area that are 28 to 31 inches wide by 57, and those are labeled B and D on the diagram provided. It's my, this, these kennels would not allow a full-size male greyhound to lie down with their head and neck in a natural position. A full-size male would have to either curl their legs or maintain their neck and head in line or below their spine. Additionally, they would not be able to turn around or lie across the kennel. These kennels do not have the added space and length as with the 10 larger kennels. These kennels should not be used to house greyhounds or lurchers or, or large dogs as they do not allow the dog to make other postural adjustments without obstruction, interference, or impediment by the presence of food, water, bowls, equipment, or other animals as stated in our town bylaw. 
There are six kennel spaces in the isolation area that are 30.5 by 91, A on the diagram provided. These kennels would not allow a full-size male greyhound to lie down with the head and neck in a natural position. A full-size male would have to either curl their legs or maintain their neck in a head in line or below their spine. Additionally, they would not be able to turn around or lie across the kennel. These kennels do not have the added space and length as with the 10 larger kennels. These kennels should not be used to house greyhound or lurches as for the same reason as listed above. And at, at this time, it is my conclusion that at this time, in light of the fact that all the items listed on the Animal Control Officer's letter dated February 6, 2017 have been repaired and Gray on Friends Incorporated Kennel at 167 uh, Saddle Hill Hopping Road does not presently meet the standards as outlined in Chapter 62 of our town bylaws. The, the facility is not presently capable of providing a humane and sanitary environment for the kenneling of greyhounds based on their size. <clears throat> when the kennel is, has addressed the identified concerns, a reinspection will be conducted and the recommended kennel capacity of the existing kennel configuration is 10 dogs. I'll be happy to answer any questions you may have if that's part of the process. Thank you, Lieutenant Bennett. We're going to move along and we will Excellent. return for questions once we've concluded all the testimony. Thank you, Madam okay. Chair. Thank you very much. Uh, I will now enter your inspection report along with reports from Hopkinton Office of Inspectional Services and the Fire Department into the record. Now, before moving on to witnesses, I will introduce into the record certain official reports issued to the Greyhound Friends Kennel, as well as public comment letters received in connection with this current license hearing, and documents that Greyhound Friends has requested we enter into the record. All of these documents can be accessed online at the town website. Um, you will need to bear with me. This list of documents to be entered into the record is quite lengthy. Um, but I believe, Mr. Miaras, I need to read it in entirety, not just a summation. That's it. Okay. Sorry. Take a breath. It's going to take a while. On January 10th, 2017, Linda Harrod, an animal in health inspector for the Mass Department of Agricultural Resources Division of Animal Health, issued a report her of her December 14, 2016 inspection of Greyhound Friends. A copy of that report will be entered into the record of this proceeding. The report concludes, this kennel currently does not meet the standards for a licensed kennel. The facility is not being maintained in a sanitary, humane manner. The inspectors named herein continue to be concerned about the proper management, cleaning, and sanitation of this kennel facility. On January 20th, 2017, the Department of Agricultural Resources issued an order to Greyhound Friends to cease and desist the importation of dogs until such time that the isolation room at Greyhound Friends meets the standards. A copy of that order will also be entered into the record. January 23rd, 2017. The town's animal control officer, William Proctor, suspended Greyhound Friends kennel license. On January 25th, 2017, town council issued a notice to Greyhound Friends that its kennel license had been suspended. A copy of that notice will also be entered into the record. On January 26th, 2017, Ms. Harrod issued a report of her January 6th and 13th, 2017 follow-up inspections of Greyhound Friends. A copy of that report will also be entered into the record. The report recommends that the Director of Animal Health issue an order, one, to cease and desist Greyhound Friends from be bringing out-of-state dogs in until the entire kennel has been repaired, including but not limited to cracks in the floor, impervious floors, broken kennel doors, broken light fixtures, rust on kennels, disintegrating concrete, clogged drains, dirt, dust, etc. Two, to require Greyhound Friends to obtain veterinary care, testing for all dogs in order to diagnose and treat the parasite issue. Three, to require Greyhound Friends to work with a certified behaviorist to diagnose and treat behavioral issues. This should include a comprehensive written plan for long-stay dogs consistent with recommendations made by the shelter veterinarians. On February 6, 2017, Mr. Proctor wrote to Greyhound Friends instructing the director of Greyhound Friends, Louise Coleman, that, quote, all dogs with the exception of four dogs must be removed from the premises, and, quote, a copy of that correspondence will also be entered into the record. 
On March 7, 2017, the Animal Rescue League of Boston Law Enforcement Department filed a criminal complaint against Greyhound Friends founder and director Louise Coleman for animal cruelty. The trial resulted in a not guilty verdict in November 2017. In connection with the 2017 criminal investigation, the board has been provided with a 236-page investigation report, including exhibits to Middlesex DA uh, Wendy Saffron. This report describes, quote, a lack of adequate care that pervades the culture at Greyhound Friends and contained detailed observations about 10 separate dogs that were housed at the kennel. Reports on these dogs were generated from kennel records that the investigator described as unacceptable and incomplete, as well as reports from other animal rescue organizations that cared for the dogs after Greyhound Friends. A copy of this report will be entered into the record. A hearing before the Board of Selectmen to determine whether to revoke or suspend Greyhound Friends last kennel license was scheduled for March 17, 2017 and due to inclement weather was rescheduled to March 28, 2017. A copy notice of that hearing will be entered into the record. On March 24, 2017, Greyhound Friends requested postponement of the board's hearing indefinitely. In that letter, Greyhound Friends stated that one, it would not contest the current suspension of its kennel license. Two, the kennel was unoccupied by any dogs. Three, the kennel has been completely renovated in February of 2017. Four, it was in the process of updating certain kennel policies and procedures in an effort to comply with the Mass DAR's cease and desist order. Five, it was in the process of reorganizing and improving its governmental structure. Six, Executive Director Louise Coleman had resigned from the board and taken a leave of absence from her position to, quote, enable the board to further evaluate changes that may be needed in the leadership of the organization, end quote. And seven, Greyhound Friends anticipated requesting a reschedule of the hearing after Mass DAR cease and desist order was lifted. A copy of that letter will also be entered into the record. Greyhound Friends was under investigation by the Massachusetts Attorney General Public Charities Division since at least February of 2017. That investigation was resolved in August 2018 and resulted in a governance agreement between Greyhound Friends and the Attorney General requiring that Greyhound Friends, one, ensure future strategic planning for the organization by taking into consideration legacy charitable purposes including rescue and adoption of greyhounds in domestic and international education and advocacy on behalf of the breed. Two, not appoint or employ founder Louise Coleman in any official capacity including as a director, corporate member, officer, employee, or independent contractor including in any role involving finances, operations, adoption, or kennel management whether paid or unpaid provided however that Ms. Coleman is permitted to raise funds on Greyhound Friends behalf in her individual capacity. Three, not act in a manner contrary to any injunctive relief which may be ordered against Ms. Coleman as part of a judgment by consent arising from the Attorney General's investigation of Greyhound Friends. Four, within six months of the date of the governance agreement, filed with the Charities Division certain amended Massachusetts and IRS forms, including required attachments for fiscal years 2013, 2014, 2015, and 2016, in order to correct any material misstatements. Five, require that the Board of Directors review all forms before they are filed with the division. Six, ensure future compliance with all legal, statutory, regulatory, and licensing requirements, and seven, file with the division on a semi-annual basis financial reports in addition to annual financial filings for three years following the date of the governance agreement. Copy of the governance agreement will also be entered into the record as will Greyhound Friends public statement with regard to this matter. Former Director Louise Coleman separately settled with the Attorney General in connection with the same investigation and agreed to pay $40,000 to a Greyhound rescue and was barred from serving in fi financial fiduciary roles for Massachusetts public charities. A copy of the Attorney General press release on this matter will be entered into the record. Prior to 2017, Greyhound Friends was subject to other investigations by the Department of Agricultural Resources. The following records of those investigations will also be entered into the record. An October 13, 20, oh, two of 2005 letter from Brad Mitchell, Director of Animal Health of the Department of Agricultural Resources, stating that the department had concluded that Greyhound Friends did not have an adequate isolation facility and prohibiting Greyhound Friends from transporting animals into the Commonwealth and requiring the kennel to submit proof that it was a registered nonprofit. 
an October 6, 2010 inspection report from Jay Kenney with the Massachusetts Department of Agricultural Resources concluding the Greyhound Friends had been, continues to, and intended to keep importing Greyhounds to Massachusetts from other states without being appropriately approved for out-of-state rescue. A February 10, 2011 report from Animal Control Officer Bill Proctor noting that he had observed 36 dogs at the kennel and that Greyhound Friends wished to increase the number of dogs permitted at the facility from the 22 plus 2 house dogs currently permitted. Mr. Proctor stated that he would not recommend an increase to the number of dogs housed at Greyhound Friends. March 24, 2011 and March 28, 2011 inspection reports from the Mass Department of Agricultural Resources noting issues with the ventilation system and approving in isolation room for use. The number of dogs fluctuated but remained above the amount permitted. It was noted that Greyhound Friends were seeking from the Board of Selectmen an increase in the number of dogs from 22 to 30. An April 14, 2011 letter from Michael Cahill, Director of the Division of Animal Health of the Department of Agricultural Resources, approving Greyhound Friends to transport animals now that the isolation facility was determined to be adequate. An April 13, 2011 inspection report from the Mass Department of Agricultural Resources listing 21 dogs on the premises. An April 15, 2011 letter from Michael Cahill, Director of the Division of Animal Health of the Department of Agricultural Resources, rescinding his previous order to cease and desist shelter rescue operations, Order 280-CD-10, and permitting Greyhound Friends to operate so long as certain conditions were met, e.g. no more than 22 dogs on the premises at any time, no new dogs to the property until there is room, all dogs imported shall move directly to the isolation facility for a minimum of 48 <coughs> hours and are examined by a veterinarian and deemed healthy, and the kennel must maintain complete and detailed records of all animals imported. A May 23, 2011 letter from Michael Cahill, Director of the Division of Animal Health of the Department of Agricultural Resources, authorizing Greyhound Friends to provide isolation services to another Greyhound Rescue Organization, provided Greyhound Friends complies with the conditions stated in DAR's April, 11, 2011, April 15, 2011 letter. I'm almost through. An August 3, 2011 inspection report from Linda Harrod, Animal Inspector for the Department of Agricultural Resources, noting that there were 33 dogs on the property, even though Greyhound Friends license permitted only 22 dogs. An August 19, 2011 cease and desist order and company notice of assessment of penalty issued by Michael Cahill, Director of the Division of Animal Health of the Department of Agricultural Resources, demanding that Greyhound Friends cease and desist acquiring animals from outside of Massachusetts and assessing a penalty of $500, Director Cahill found that by exceeding Kennel's limit of dogs, Kennel violated his prior conditional rescission order of 280-CD-10. A history of Greyhound's Kennel license from September 13, 1988 to August 10, 2011, prepared by Jerry Holland, Executive Dis Assistant to the Board of Selectmen for the Selectmen's Office file and fax to Director Cahill. A September 9, 2011 letter from the Hoffington Town Manager to Director Cahill reporting that Greyhound Friends had received approval from the town to increase the number of dogs at the kennel and requesting that Director Cahill lift cease and desist order 338-CD-11, including attachments showing approvals from the Hoppington Zoning Board of Appeals and Hoppington Board of Health. A September 13, 2011 letter from Michael Cahill, Director of the Division of Animal Health of the Department of Agricultural Resources, rescinding his previous order to cease and desist shelter rescue operations, Order 338-CD-11, and permitting Greyhound Friends to operate so long as certain conditions were met, e.g. no more than 30 dogs on the premises at any time, no new dogs to the property until there is room, all dogs imported shall move directly to the isolation facility for the minimum of 48 hours and are examined by a veterinarian and deemed healthy, and the kennel must maintain complete and detailed records of all animals imported. A May 1, 2013 inspection report of Linda Harrod, Animal Inspector for the Department of Agricultural Resources, noting that Greyhound Friends is now importing several breeds of hound dogs from out of state. 
An October 13, 2015 letter to Greyhound Friends from the Department of Agricultural Resources describing a complaint that the department received regarding <coughs> conditions at the kennel and treatment of the dogs residing there. The letter described conditions observed by Inspector Linda Harrod and MSPCA Officer Elise Kelly on October 12, 2, 2015 and concerns that the inspectors had regarding overcrowding, long stays, and dogs that were difficult placements, quote, end quote. A March 1st, 2016 inspection report list issued from Linda Harrod to Director Michael Cahill describing inspections of the kennel on October 2nd, 2015 and November 12th, 2015, the latter of which was performed by Inspector Harrod, Officer Kelly, and Lieutenant Borgel of the Animal Rescue League of Boston. The report again expressed concern about overcrowding and dogs languishing in the kennel for too long. A March 28, 2016 memo from Linda Harrod, Animal Health Inspector with the Department of Agricultural Resources, describing a meeting with five members of the Board of Directors of Greyhound Friends. One corporate member, the Hopkinton Animal Control Officer, Lieutenant Borgel, Officer Kelly, and Inspector Harrod. Topics discussed included long stay dogs, kennel size, behavior evaluations, the Mod Squad program, pit bulls, transfer of dogs to other shelters, including a notorious shelter named Sweet Pea Shelter. A February 20th, 2016 inspection report from Hopkinton Animal Control Officer indicating his approval of the kennel. On June 7th, 2018, Greyhound Friends filed an application for a kennel license with the town clerk with a supplemental statement requesting that the town clerk not act on the application until after the Board of Selectmen had an opportunity to hold a hearing on the matter. That application along with Greyhound Friends supplemental statement and the June 29, 2018 version of Greyhound Friends frequently asked questions memorandum will be entered into the record. On, on August 6, 2018, Town Council Raymond Miara sent a letter to the town manager, Norman Kamalo, describing the process for issuing kennel licenses and the unique process that Greyhound Friends and the town have agreed to follow for this particular license application. A copy of that letter will be entered into the record. To prepare for this hearing, we have obtained records from the Secretary of State's Corporations Division pertaining to the Greyhound Friends organization. Those records indicate the following. There are currently 10 different, 10 officers and directors of the organization. Seven of these were officers or directors when the 2016-2017 violations occurred. The current president has been an officer or director since 2009. The current clerk has been an officer or director since 2005. Since the 2016-2017 violations, five officers or directors have left the organization. Annual reports of Greyhound Friends, Inc. from 2005, 2009, and 2017 will be entered into the record along with a certificate of change of directors or officers of nonprofit corporations from June 19, 2018. In connection with the governance agreement executed between Greyhound Friends and the Massachusetts Attorney General, Greyhound Friends held a special meeting of the members on August 1st, 2018, where they approved the adoption of staggered terms and term designations for current directors, agreed to restate the Greyhound Friends bylaws, and elected a president-elect to fill the office until 2019. A copy of the clerk certificate from this August 1st, 2018 special meeting of the members, along with the restated bylaws, will be entered into the record. In connection with today's hearing, we have received 117 letters from members of the general public in support of Greyhound Friends and 86 letters from members of the general public and other shelters, as well as one petition with approximately 1,800 signatures that are critical of the facility's practices. Copies of these letters and petition will be entered into the record. Greyhound Friends have also requested that the following records be entered into the record. An August 26, 2018 letter from Greyhound Friends to the Board of Selectmen and Town Manager. A May 29, 2018 letter from the Commonwealth of Massachusetts Office of the Attorney General confirming that Greyhound Friends is registered with the organization's Public Charities Division, is up to date with its annual filings and have a certificate, has a certificate of solicitation valid through November 15, 2018. Greyhound Friends 2018 Procedures and Policies Handbook, Greyhound Friends 2018 Procedures and Policies Handbook Summary, four pages, Greyhound Friends Clerk Certificate Documenting Board Policy Restricting Admission of New Dogs to Kennel to Greyhounds and Lurchers, 
Illustration of digitized electronic recording keeping s record keeping system, staffing plan, a transcript of the verdict in the Louise Coleman trial, a memorandum entitled The Truth About Ten Dogs at Greyhound Friends, a document entitled Greyhound Friends Board of Directors and Officers, Brief Biographies, a document entitled The Real Truth About Greyhound Friends, Frequently Asked Questions, a May 17, 2017 letter from Greyhound Friends Board of Directors to Michael Cahill, Director, Division of Animal Health, Mass Department of Agricultural Resources, with attached resume of Jeffrey Schindler, Ph.D., a February 20, 2017 invoice from K. Samard, and a 2017 invoice from HDF Painting. Thank you for your patience. <laughs> <laughs> if you're still awake. <laughs> Next, I will allow representatives of Greyhound Friends to make a 10-minute presentation regarding their proposed licensure of the Greyhound Friends kennel. Please step up to the microphone and uh, introduce yourself. And we are watching the clock. Madam Chairwoman, we have three witnesses and counsel. May we bring another chair up? Uh, we have one. Sure. <coughs> we also have a PowerPoint presentation, and my understanding was that there would be a picture on the table. Okay, uh, our understanding is this is a 10 minute presentation, so it's uh, your choice as to how you wish to, to use your time. But at 10 minutes, I will ask you to, run, to wrap it up. As you're giving your presentation, if you'd like to just say next slide, we'll advance the slide from in here. Okay? The presenters? Can, can Veronica, <coughs> Veronica can tell you. Okay, so we are ready to begin. Okay, uh, please uh, give your name and address, introduce yourself, and please proceed. Madam Chair, members of the board, my name is Stoddard Malhado. I live at 32 Oak Hill Road in Littleton. I'm currently president of the board of directors at Greyhound Friends. 25 years ago, my wife Kai and I traveled from our home in Littleton to Saddle Hill Road in Hopkinton, a trip that changed our lives forever. We returned home with two Greyhounds, the first of 16 that we have adopted into our home and into our hearts. I'd like to start by just mentioning a, a couple of uh, misperceptions. Our kennels are sized specifically to serve the needs of this unique breed. 2016 town inspection reported the dogs are able to stand, lie down, and turn around freely. Also, these, these dogs come from tracks with a uh, minimum size for them in Florida is two feet by three feet. Our kennels are much, much bigger than that, and the dogs are used to being and like small spaces. As I look back on my 25-year involvement with Greyhound Friends, I am proud of many things. I'm proud of the vision that our founder, Louise Coleman, had for a life after racing for these special dogs. 
I'm proud of the over 10,000 dogs that have made their way through Greyhound Friends and into new lives in loving homes. I'm proud of our educational outreach program that has enabled thousands of students, many in Hopkinton, to learn about this remarkable breed and the importance of treating all animals with kindness. I'm proud of the advocacy that Greyhound Friends has had for Greyhounds throughout the world, vastly improving the lives of Greyhounds in Ireland, Greyhounds in Galgos in Spain, and helping to stop brutal Greyhound treatment in Argentina. I'm proud of the numerous volunteers from the wider community who have devoted countless hours to caring for the dogs of Greyhound Friends and raising awareness of our work and promoting Greyhound adoption throughout New England and beyond. I'm proud of Greyhound Friends' response to the 2017 cease and desist issued by the MDAR, totally renovating our facility, going far beyond what was mandate, mandated by the DAR, and working cooperatively with the department to write protocols for the care of our dogs, sanitizing our kennel, and maintenance of electronic record keeping that exhibit best practices and we hope will establish the standard for similar, uh, similar kennels in the Commonwealth. And finally, I'm proud of the hard work that we have done in conjunction with the Attorney General's Office, reorganizing our leadership, addressing governance and board concerns, and rewriting our bylaws to reflect best practices for nonprofits in Massachusetts. Specifically, we have expanded our board of directors to add oversight capacity in finance and accounting, kennel compliance, and animal care best practices, and electronic record keeping and database function. We've engaged in strategic pan planning, prioritizing, rehoming, and adoption of greyhounds from our kennel in Hopkinton. And as you will see from the materials submitted with our license application, we have adopted a policy providing that greyhound friends will only accept greyhounds and greyhound lurchers. We've restated the Greyhound Friends bylaws to, among other things, adopt staggered terms for board members and term limits, both of which will ensure stable board turnover and a good blend of institutional wisdom and fresh viewpoints. And included in the bylaws are requirements that employees of Greyhound Friends are not eligible to, for election to the board and may not serve as officers. But much of this is in the past, and we are here tonight to talk about the present and the future. Soon, as a result of the term limits now contained in our bylaws, I will be stepping down from the Greyhound Board of Directors. And tonight, I'd like to, to introduce you to the future leadership of our organization, President-elect Karen Amy Rose. Ms. Rose volunteered at Greyhound Friends when she was in high school, and again when she returned to the area in 2009. She has been active with our meet and greet team, which does community outreach about the Greyhound breed, Greyhound International Welfare, and Greyhound Friends advocacy and rehoming work. And she and her spouse have two adopted dogs at home, one a Galgo and one a Greyhound Lurcher, who makes hospital visits to rehabilitation and Alzheimer's patients as a certified therapy dog. Going forward, Ms. Rose will continue to be a collaborative, highly competent, and compassionate voice for our organization. Karen Amy. Thank you, Stoddard. Madam Chair and Selectman, why am I here? Why would I join the Greyhound Friends Board of Directors in late 2017 when it was facing a storm of troubles that I was going to enumerate, but it uh, seems I don't have to at this point in the evening. Um, including one of those things is becoming a target of repeated unceasing uh, and often inaccurate social media attacks, especially an online campaign largely driven by a small group of people, not witnesses who have no personal knowledge. They continually paint Greyhound Friends as a symbol of greed and neglect. That campaign is in direct conflict with my own many memories of the kennel in the 80s, 90s, and 2000s as a wonderful, loving place full of contented Greyhounds moving on to homes. These memories have always been precious to me because that is not a guaranteed environment for greyhounds. They have racing careers lasting two to five years and their natural lifespan is 12 to 15. 
They are born and sold not as pets, but as commodities. Around the world, they are found in laboratories, in the streets, hanging from trees, and in open-air butcheries where they're slaughtered in front of each other and waiting customers. 35 years ago, Greyhound Friends stepped up to advocate on behalf of this swift and intelligent breed. The organization's historic track record in educating the public and successfully rehoming thousands of these animals is beyond dispute. Greyhound Friends was provided, created to provide an essential bridge from that racing career to many more years as a pet. For decades, it has shared critical knowledge about the unique needs of this breed and the imperative to treat them and all animals with intelligence and sensitivity. Greyhound Friends has shown in the past as a symbol of a more humane future. Greyhounds are still racing in Florida and other states. On top of the regular flow of dogs from tracks and farms to retirement, track closures or legislative changes result in urgent critical adoption needs. If homes are not readily found, these greyhounds are at risk of being sold overseas and out of sight of any animal welfare regulation at all. It's true. Greyhound Friends had begun to overtax its resources in the years leading up to 2017, but dismantling a key national and international rescue organization is not the solution. We've lost sight of the real problem we're trying to solve. We, sh we should all have the same goal, which is a state-of-the-art Greyhound sanctuary actively guiding retired dogs to new families. Many of the letters of concern sent to you in the past year specifically say that they would support Greyhound Friends reopening under changed circumstances, and those circumstances have demonstrably changed. We greatly appreciate the efforts of the town in conducting this thorough inspection and sharing the results, and we look forward to a future of working in good faith to reach that goal together. With my board colleagues, I've had the opportunity for training and education in board <coughs> governance, and I'm grateful for Stoddard's guidance while I serve as president-elect. I look forward to serving as the next Greyhound Friends board president soon. I'm not here to tell you, excuse me, I'm not here to tell you that Greyhound Friends deserves a license because of abuse elsewhere. <coughs> I'm here to tell you that Greyhound Friends promises to Hopkinton, as well as the organizations and regulators, regulators of Massachusetts Animal Welfare, that it has absorbed the right lessons. The commitment of Greyhound Friends volunteer board and community in tirelessly working with expert for well over a year to identify and implement the best people, practices, and priorities for our organization is well documented in the packet submitted to inspectors and the board. Greyhound Friends is ready to operate in a more modern and responsive manner while remaining true to its core mission. This will be fully proven in future service to Greyhounds in the community. Greyhound Friends should be supported to continue to serve as a life-saving organization and beacon of hope for future animals. We hope the Hopkinton Board of Selectmen will agree and support our kennel license application. Terry Shepard will now tell you more about Greyhound Friends' improved kennel operations. Thank you, Karen Amy. My name is Teresa Shepard. I have accepted the newly created position as Kennel and Operations Manager to begin upon the reopening of our kennel. I will resign as the director and will report to the board as I begin work in this capacity. My key responsibilities will include managing all staff and volunteers, to all dog intakes to ensure proper accommodation, as well as transportation from our isolation unit through the protocol phases outlined in our handbook towards adoption. I will also, also supervise the maintenance of electronic and paper record files, which is what we did not have before. We only used to keep all of our records in paper form, which <coughs> is obviously an issue. At present, we anticipate most of the veterinary needs of our dogs will be met by local veterinarians off-site at their offices or animal hospitals. We will, of <coughs> course, have a licensed veterinarian working with us to evaluate and release dogs from our isolation unit. I would like to adjust to the change of management. How will it be different from before? The biggest change is that Greyhound Friends is no longer controlled by its founder. I will be a paid employee and accountable to the board. My job requires me and all other employees to adhere to all protocols, <coughs> policies, and procedures governing our kennel. I have worked with our compliance officer and the board to develop these standards for the last year, and we feel that we have a very comprehensive plan in place to allow us to maintain a healthy, happy, and safe environment for our Greyhounds to thrive in. In response to the Department of Agriculture's cease and desist, we un undertook a total renovation of the interior of a kennel, replacing all existing kennel hardware, filling and sealing floor cracks, repairing walls, damaged woodwork, painting ceilings, floors, and walls throughout the isolation unit, main kennel, kitchen, laundry room, surgery room, and recovery areas. 
<clears throat> These renovations, which cost approximately $50,000, were completed in six weeks in early 2017. At the same time, we evaluated our outdoor enclosures and purchased rescue hydrofoam equipment for ongoing use and to completely sanitize the outside P-stone runs. Um, in connection with our recent kennel inspection, we shared our updated protocols and procedures handbook with the town inspection team. A summary of this handbook was also submitted with your application for your review. The handbook protocols and procedures incorporate all ele elements required by the sanitation and humane treatment aspects of the Hop Hopkins and Town Bylaws. We are fortunate to have Dr. Schindler, jo Dr. Jeffrey Schindler's assistant and yeah, assistance in preparing this handbook. He is a cancer researcher whose professional associations have included area universities and hospitals as well as commercial and pharmaceutical industry. Dr. Schindler holds a PhD in biology from MIT and joined us in 2017 as a director and a compliance officer, working with Corette Shelter Medicine Program at UC Davis as well as with Dr. Pantaleon DVM at Virox Animal Health, Dr. Schindler wrote protocols and procedures specifically designed for Greyhound Friends and, begin, and brings to the board an expertise in animal care protocols based on federal and state compliance as well as the ability to train non-scientists in the scientific concepts. Please bring your comments to a close, Ms. Shepard. Okay. Um, I would just like to say we have worked so hard over the past year with not against regulators to make this an exemplary organization. Our protocols and procedures were created with direct input from the Department of Agriculture. Our new plan for governments was created with the participation and ultimate acceptance of the Attorney General. These regu regulatory agencies have seen, participated in, and accepted our changes. Now we ask the town to accept them as well. We are ready to move forward working with the town, within its bylaws, and follow the mission we are all passionate about, finding homes for the retired racing greyhound. We would appreciate your support in the issuance of our kennel license. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. The next part of our hearing, I will allow representatives uh, I will, uh, excuse me, I will allow 10 minutes for witnesses in opposition to the licensure to speak to the board. The first uh, opposition witness uh, is Lieutenant Alan Borgel of the Animal Rescue League of Boston. Is Lieutenant Borgel here this evening? Yes, ma'am. Here we are. Uh, and, and because we have five individuals and about another 10 minutes, uh, I would ask roughly two minutes, Mr. Lieutenant Borgel. I know you can do it. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, my name is Lieutenant Alan Borgel. I'm with the Director of Law Enforcement for the NRS League of Boston. I've worked for the NRS League for 43 years. Um, I'm very active in, in excuse me, uh, investigations and inspections, particularly with the Department of Agriculture resources. So obviously, uh, um, Madam Chairwoman, you gave the background of what inspections we did and everything. So I'll just read this quickly and try to paraphrase. But I elected to appear before the Town of Hopkins Selectman today, September 11, 2018, to confirm that I was part of the inspection and subsequent investigation of the Greyhound Friends Kennel facility. The Board of Selectmen of Hopkins and Police Department already has uh, Mass Department of Agriculture and Rush League Boston reports from the above background information. So. I'd like to testify that after the meeting with the Greyhound Friends Board in 2016, there were numerous suggestions and advice, um, friendly advice given to the executive director, their board of directors, and the current president, Stata Mojado. He indicated he heard us loud and clear, and they would start to address many concerns um, and try to get these things corrected. So anyway, numerous months went by, Mass Department Agriculture, State Animal Inspector, and I finally went back to inspect almost eight or nine months later in um, the kennel facility on December 14, 2016. And the kennel facility was found to be in worse condition than most of the recommendations that were supposed to be addressed or corrected by the executive director and the board of directors and their staff were not done. In a joint report, MDAR State Animal Inspector Linda Harris and I wrote the following. In closing, this kennel does not meet the standards for a licensed kennel in Chapter 140. So particularly the records, um, and I think what's happened is the lieutenant from Hopkinton found the same thing. 
the inspection of the kennel dog records, it's almost impossible to determine what they're doing with some of these dogs. So particularly uh, veterinary records. There was a veterinarian on the board, um, I think her name was Dr. Misha Levy, told us on the phone that we don't test for anything. So meaning they don't do any, they didn't do any extra blood work or anything on certain dogs that showed signs of being sick. So that was a huge red flag to us. The kennel facility was not found to be sanitary and the cleaning protocols were non-existent. The kennel staff um, didn't even really have any sort of idea what bleach was or any of their cleaning agents. They were using Fabulousa. As, um, it's one of the cheapest things that you can get and you're not really supposed to mix things with bleach either. So, But numerous dogs in particular were held for years with no plan to get them out of their kennel stress environment, these long stay dogs. So even after eight months sitting down and giving them all sorts of avenues to get to, um, the only reason, and, and um, Attorney Reinhardt did a very good job presenting everything, but I will explain that they were forced into this. The Department, Department of Agriculture forced them into this. The Town of Hawkington forced them into this. The University of Boston forced them into this. And you have the Attorney General's office that forced them to comply with other records. So I have no faith in the current Grand Friend Board of Directors or their staff to operate or maintain a kennel license if the license was to be reinstated after suspension. And this is obviously the decision of the town of Hopkinton, not mine. If the kennel license is reinstated, the only thing I would state is that routine inspections by qualified authorities, uh, I think the lieutenant did a good job, should continue to be performed so ground friend stays in compliance. So even after all this time, you've got a, a lieutenant that goes in, they still don't have the records. That's the biggest problem that Linda Harrod and I were having. So that's, that concludes my testimony. I'm here in the flesh if you have any questions. Thank you, Lieutenant Borgel, thank you. and thank you for coming. Um, next, we will hear from Ms. Leslie Doyle. She is a former director of Greyhound Friends Incorporated. Ms. Doyle. know where to begin um, keep it short <laughs> yeah. um, I just want to start off by saying I feel like there's this misconception that people think that there's this all-or-nothing attitude about Greyhound friends like you either have to like blindly support them and not question anything they did in the past or like people want the place like run out of town and uh, that's not how I feel I personally am not opposed to Greyhound friends reopening and doing advocacy work I just do not feel that this management and this board is capable of understanding what it takes to humanely care for dogs. Um, during my time at Greyhound Friends, I discovered that the director was using donor money without accounting for it, and that the board members were aware of this for a long time and did not put a stop to it. In addition, the organization's financial decisions left us unable to properly care for the dogs. This is an organization that took in more than $3 million over a five-year period, and literally there were some days there was no money for dog food. I walked in one day during the summer to find the electricity had been shut off in the kennel. This seemed very odd to me because we had just received a request for, a bequest for $224,000 a month before. I saw a young beagle mix struggling to breathe and left for many weeks waiting to have surgery. Our veterinarian had said her breathing problems would get worse with stress, yet Greyhound Friends kept her living in a separate crate from her mother in a filthy room. She wasn't even ha able to have the comfort of her mother while she was left waiting for medical care. This, time, this kind of neglect does not happen because of one executive director. It was a small place. People knew what was happening, and they let it happen. Um, and this is heartbreaking because this is an organization that had very dedicated, passionate volunteers who love this breed. and. I just want to say for my part as a board member, I wish I could have changed it internally. I really tried. Um, we had dogs in the kennel and at our off-site facilities that were suffering from fleas, ticks, and internal parasites and not being properly treated. Our veterinarian asked us in July 2016 simply, she said, the dogs are coming in crawling with fleas and they have, forgive me, bloody diarrhea and they just need this treatment, inexpensive dewormer and flea and tick control. This issue was brought up at every board meeting for six months. It was never done. I mean, these are problems that were easily fixable, and they were not fixed. Um, I could go on and I'll give you a handout because I don't want to go through every gross detail. Um, 
each time I tried to address communication, <coughs> or I introduced the board to animal welfare experts, they would tell me it's better than where the dogs came from. And that may well be in some cases, but I do not feel that's an excuse to give substandard care. <coughs> this is one of my biggest concerns. After the Massachusetts Attorney General's Office began investigating Greyhound Friends, <coughs> We as a board hired a nonprofit attorney who previously worked at the AG's office to help us enact governance measures. I very naively thought this was gonna right the ship. <laughs> like, it's gonna fix the problems. But despite being under the eye of the Attorney General's <coughs> office, Greyhound Friends continued to write new policies and turn around and break them, made misstatements on IRS 990s, perjured themselves on Secretary of State forums, continued to do things that were conf conflict of interest, continued to pay our staff late. These are people who were like working so hard to care for these dogs, some of them working paycheck to paycheck and not getting paid while our director was dining out on a donor dime and the board continued to look the other way. Um, I repeatedly asked the board president and executive director for access to financial records. I tried to work with them to find ways to cut costs. I tried to get the board to simply vote on a budget. There were always excuses why this couldn't be done. Please bring your comments to a close. Okay. In reading the public records regarding the many previous violations, it became clear that when animal welfare and law enforcement professionals reached out about improving the care of the dogs or even initiating minor enforcement actions, Greyhound Friends' response was often to accuse the agencies of making personal attacks on them. These are public servants who are simply trying to do their job and trying to get us as a rescue to do ours. And that continued, that was not just the executive director doing that. Um, I just wanna say I think rescuing dogs is a really noble mission, but it comes with great responsibility. This board has demonstrated a lack of ability to care for dogs humanely, a blatant unwillingness to protect dogs and people from infectious disease, and truly such a profound lack of understanding of dog behavior that they've repeatedly put dogs and people at risk. They may have good intentions, but they have brought harm to these dogs. My problem, <laughs> I watched from a side after the closure, and it just reinforced my fears. I mean, this is just one example. They kept a dog named Herschel in the kennel while construction work was going on, while he was recovering from a broken leg. It does not take an animal behaviorist to tell you that it's a horrifically bad decision that would endanger the dog and the people around him that is asking for a dog bite. Graham Friends euthanized Herschel shortly after that, allegedly after he attempted to bite. He was just two years old. Could Thank this dog you, had a chance in another shelter? I cannot say, but he did not get the he did not get the right chance there. Thank you, Leslie. Thank you. Next, we will hear from Ms. Kathy Lundgren. She is also a former director of Greyhound Friends Incorporated. Kathy, just try for two minutes. Okay, I know it's hard. I'll be best. Um, as a former Greyhound Friends board member and volunteer coordinator, I was physically at the shelter for more than 300 days between 2014 and 2016. I was there when officers from ARL, MDAR, MSPCA came and tried to explain that dogs were being harmed. Free help was offered at Grey and Greyhound Friends promised to change, but they broke that promise. I tried to convince other board members to make changes internally that would benefit the animals kenneled there. And at one point, the, the members agreed to do so, but then never followed through. In February 2016, the board realized that the financial records and the spending by the director was inappropriate, and the board could not continue to turn a blind eye. The board also discussed and came to a conclusion that dogs should not be warehoused for years like they had routinely been at Greyhound Friends. The board told Ms. Coleman that if she didn't follow a new performance improvement plan, she was going to be removed. She ignored it, the board did nothing. And then I realized nothing would change. I resigned from the board January 24th, 2017. The number of agencies that have been either involved or infect, affected by this group is staggering. <coughs> Here are just the ones I can think of off the top of my head. Massachusetts Department of Agricultural Resources, Animal Rescue League of Boston, Massachusetts Society for Prevention of Cruelty to Animals, Hopkinton Board of Selectmen, Hopkinton Police, Massachusetts State Attorney General, Middlesex District Attorney, Second Chance Animal Shelter, Bay Path Humane Society, Rainbow Rescues, Lowell Humane, Medfield Animal Shelter, Pity Love Rescue, Animal Protection Center of Southeast Massachusetts. Greyhound Friends management and board members have blatantly defied all these agencies over and over and over again. 
and to the point where criminal charges were made against the director, the kennel license was lost, and the attorney general conducted an investigation. It's unheard of in Massachusetts for an animal inspector, to, for an animal shelter to have three cease and desist orders and to be closed repeatedly because of multiple infractions, including overcrowding and not following state quarantine requirements. Dogs suffered there, Greyhound Friends people knew it. Well-meaning people tried to intervene, state agencies tried many, many times to get them to wake up and treat the dogs better. They offered free help, Greyhound Friends never took them up on the offer. Despite the claim that they have a new board, at least five are the same board members that allowed Greyhound Friends to repeatedly get back into this predicament. They have not taken any responsibility for the conditions they have left those animals in, so why are we to believe that anything will change? The dogs deserve better, and I ask you not to issue a kennel license to Greyhound Friends. Thank you. Thank you, Kathy. Now we will hear from Ms. Julie Waxstein. She is a former Greyhound Friends Incorporated employee. Ms. I'm Waxstein. Not an employee. I'm sorry. That's okay. <laughs> I know you're an animal evaluator, I believe. Yes. I, okay. I did some of that. I forgive Good me. <clears throat> I just want to say this is way past my bedtime. I just hope it's not past yours. So you're speaking as a profession, an animal professional. Correct. Uh, my name is <coughs> Julie Waxstein. I spent a fair amount of time at Greyhound Friends the year before they closed. I was there in several different capacities, but one function was to evaluate dogs for a group called Animatch. I've been to dozens of facilities, I've evaluated hundreds of dogs, and I can honestly say that what I witnessed at Greyhound Friends was highly abnormal and very, very troubling. <coughs> About a year before they closed, I became aware that there were 20 dogs in their care for over a year some for several years, and one as long as four and a half years. To say this is not normal is an understatement. One or two dogs would be bad enough, but this was 20 dogs living in an incredibly stressful environment for over a year, often in their kennels for two, two, 23 and a half hours a day. After much pressure, many of these dogs deemed as difficult placements <coughs> were moved to other shelters and adopted within a few months or weeks or like Trevor, he was there for three years and adopted in eight days. I was struck by a letter from the trainer employed at Greyhound Friends for the last three years. Just like her, I witnessed so many dogs displaying the effects of long-term kenneling, such as barrier aggression, spinning, pacing, banging off walls, and depression. In addition to showing clear signs of severe stress and anxiety, many of them were extremely fearful as well. Here is one example. In a report by the state, a dog named Sammy was seen on more than one visit, trembling in fear when dogs erupted in barking. I am a witness to that as well. So how many times do you think that happened in a busy kennel? 10, 15, 20 times a day? Let's take the low end of 10 times. She was there for two years, which means she trembled in fear over 7,000 times. Have you ever been so scared that you physically shook? Can you imagine feeling that daily for two years? Unfortunately, our laws aren't strong enough to protect animals. While warehousing dogs is not currently against the law, it is wrong, it is cruel, and it is absolutely inhumane. If you ask other reputable, <clears throat> reputable animal welfare professionals in this country, they will tell you the same. Years of warnings, second chances, and a huge drain on state and local resources. Enough, enough already. This is the same group of people. Why should we expect anything different? especially since they barely acknowledge any wrongdoing. A vote note tonight is a vote to protect animals and to send a message that this town will not tolerate animal cruelty. <coughs> Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Wagstein. And finally, uh, we will hear from Dr. Joanne Lindenmayer. She is a doctor of veterinary medicine, a master of public health, and an epidemiologist. Dr. Linda Mayer, thank you for coming to speak to us tonight. Thank you very much for letting me speak tonight. And let me know if I'm blasting your eardrums. I know it's late. <laughs> okay. So my name is Joanne Linden Mayer. I'm a veterinarian, adjunct professor of public health, and chair of the leadership committee of a national humane veterinary medical organization. I'm also, as um, Chairman Wright mentioned, the um, an epidemiologist, which is a branch of medical science that deals with the incidence distribution and control of disease in populations, including shelter populations. I do not appear before this board to fault people who feel a sense of loyalty to Greyhound Friends or to its founder, 
nor to relitigate findings of recent court cases and agreements. But I have two points that I'd like to make. First, the charge of felony cruelty was applied only to the sanitary environment in which dogs were kept. The Association of Shelter Veterinarians described the exact wording of this section in Mass General Laws as 19th century, stating that it can be difficult to apply this outdated anti-cruelty language to address modern concerns about physical and psychological suffering from confinement, as well as suffering from illness and death. What was litigated was a narrow definition of cruelty that considered only physical plant, drainage, and removal of feces. As an epidemiologist, I can state unequivocally that the health, welfare, and well-being of shelter animals depends on far more than updated chain link fences, fresh coats of paint, and poop removal. Among the most serious issues that were not litigated but were, are relevant to humane care and disease transmission, not only to other dogs but to people as well, include confinement of many dogs for far longer than the recommended limit of 28 days, as was mentioned some for many years, failure to provide kennels of sufficient size and exceeding shelter capacity, failure to test for and treat communicable diseases and conditions, and failure to document bites to Greyhound Friends staff and members of the public. Second, and here's where I have something to, um, for you to see, members of the Greyhound Friends Board failed to address problems in spite of repeated warnings over a period of more than 10 years, agreeing to adopt reasonable policies and procedures only after an investigation by the Attorney General. Of 13 board members in 2016, seven remain on the board. Photos and videos of current staff shelter, shelter staff mocking kennel size requirements and numerous writings by current board members criticizing legitimate health and welfare complaints mm -hmm. make it clear that the board and staff do not understand or appreciate the gravity of these concerns. Please consider whether the same board members or their allies can fully and faithfully exercise their responsibilities to care for dogs humanely care for dogs in the future. Final point is that greyhound racing is declining everywhere. The trend in animal sheltering is to merge or close operations once an organization is no longer necessary. Given these considerations, does it make sense to grant this organization a license? And I want to thank you for your time and attention. And thank you, Dr. Lyndon Mayer, for giving your time to speak. Now we have arrived at our public comment session. I will allow public comment for 20 minutes. During the public comment period, I will ask those speaking in favor of the licensure of Greyhound Friends to form one line at this central microphone and those opposed to the licensure to form another to my right beside the white curtain at that microphone. I will then allow commenters from the two lines to take turns offering comments to the board. A few words before we begin this process. We want to emphasize we are seeking information based on direct observations and as such we will ask that each person <coughs> speaking provide a brief statement how they came to acquire direct knowledge of the Greyhound Friends Kennel prior to speaking. And again because we are allowing only 20 minutes that would be 10 minutes per side. Uh, you're going we're probably going to have maybe five comments per side two minutes apiece more or less. Um, I want to make one clarifying comment on the amount of public comment time that is being allowed. We understand that many people feel very passionately about this proceeding and animal welfare. As noted, the board has received hundreds of letters concerning this facility and will consider them all when making its recommendation. Given the time constraints the board of the board, we ask those speaking during the public comment period keep their statements to under two minutes each to allow as many people wishing to speak to have the opportunity to do so. We also ask commenters to refrain from repeating any statements that the commenter knows has already been entered into the record either from another commenter or in a letter that is already in the record. 
Um, and I will start at the central microphone with Dr. Roman. Please, Hi, uh, two minutes uh, or less. Okay, Dr. Margot Roman, I'm a veterinarian. I'm actually the first veterinarian to take care of greyhound friends, greyhounds. Um, and when I was teaching at Tufts, we had the greyhounds coming in and there was nowhere to send them. And I was taking them out the back door. They were supposed to be all euthanized and used for research um, for the anatomy lab. And I was taking them and it was very sad for me that I could not find homes for these dogs. So when Louise opened Greyhound Friends, I volunteered to help her take care of these animals. And I have not been involved in the last 20 years with her. So, but in the beginning I was. And I think that we need to give a second chance, just like we're giving a second chance to these greyhounds. There were thousands and thousands of animals that she was able to take in, and she's not a very organized person. I'm not defending her in that regard. But I think if we can get a second chance, just like we give the animals, and make this kennel the starring light of good care for animals, get them into programs where they understand fear free, even make this kennel one of the ones that like Los Angeles is doing, they're trying to save more animals by making these animals plant-based and giving them a plant-based diet and they figured they could save 30,000 additional lives by going plant-based in Los Angeles County. I'm willing to give them some of my time as a veterinarian here in Hopkinton, but I think that we can make, give them a chance and have them inspected monthly if you need to, to make sure they're doing the right thing. But I think it's an opportunity to do something and have something start really good from Hopkinton that can make lives for animals better. Thank you, Dr. Roman. From the other microphone, please. I asked for a quick presentation, but at the beginning, you the attorney minutes. for Greyhound Friends. You use your Friends, time as you wish. At the beginning, the attorney for Greyhound Friends mentioned um, a document called The Truth About Ten Dogs. I have one of those ten dogs, okay? I want you to see the real truth. My name is Jackie Landry. I've been involved with rescue for over 20 years. I fostered over 150 dogs. I've conducted hundreds of home visits, phone screens. I've made the decision on who gets um, a particular dog. <coughs> and I'm involved currently with day-to-day -day operation of kennel and isola um, isolation operations. A Little bit nervous. So at this point, there's so much emotion surrounding Greyhound friends. And how can there not be when you have people that really care about dogs from both sides? I'm not without emotion. But what I'm going to do today is I'm going to stick to just the facts. All of the emotion from both sides, the propaganda, the PR, the marketing ploys of Greyhound Friends is deflected from the facts. So here we go. I received a phone call in January of 2017. There was a dog in distress and deteriorating at Greyhound Friends and they needed to get her out of there fast before she got worse. One of the volunteers stated that Diamond, now Emma, had been confined in a small kennel for an average of 23 hours a day for at least 60 days. That's 2,760 hours of a dog not getting basic care, no toys, no stimulation. 2,760 hours to suffer, and she was one of the lucky ones. Pity Love asked Greyhound Friends for the appropriate paperwork that's required by law, especially when you're taking a dog from out of state. Where were her medical records? Well, she had none. We said from Pity Love that she needed to have records. We needed to see if, where her heartworm test fell. They said that this dog, Emma, and you have the pictures in front of you, was a dog that could not be touched, that she was not good with people. So they did not give her the basic care that she needed. Interestingly enough, in order for us to take this dog, she needed to have a heartworm test. They produced it the following day. She was heartworm positive. Fact. Emma and many other dogs were provided, uh, deprived of their basic needs. Fact, Emma arrived at my house after being rescued from Greyhound Friends. She was dirty, she had a wretched smell coming from her really small body. She was scratching at her ears. She had a dry cough and it sounded like a choke, like she could not breathe. Within an hour of arriving, I had her in the bathtub. This is a dog that Louise Coleman said could not be handled. She had live and embedded ticks all over her body and she's white. It was so easy to tell. I began washing the layers of dirt and debris off of her body as she licked my face. This is one of the 10 dogs that Louise said could not be handled. Her nails were long, they were curling over and it caused her pain to walk. An hour after that, she was fast asleep on the couch with my boyfriend and my 10 pound cat. I brought it to the vet to begin heartworm treatment. Fact. Greyhound Friends recently released a statement defending their lack of care for Emma, stating that she was impossible to handle. 
fact, Greyhound Friends provided another false statement. Please I gave her back one to day close. after she was here. Pardon? Please bring your comments to a close. It's been three minutes. Fact. Greyhound Friends said that they could not take this dog out to socialize. Fact. I fostered over 40 dogs in the last year. Every one of them has been welcomed in my home from Emma. You have pictures of each and every one of them. Thank you very much. My very final comment is I'm not sure why we're here today. Greyhound Friends has been giving so many chances, 30 years of chances. And the one thing I want to leave you with is my dog had to be rescued from a rescue. I don't get it. Thank you. Hi, I'd like to rebut, I guess you could say, give a rebuttal. No, no, you were simply um, to make no, comments on the it's shelter. It's facts. I'm the person that she spoke to. No, you're not. And I, no, no, I didn't speak to you. I'm the one who made the phone call. Excuse no, me. No, I made I'm the sorry. Phone call. Thank you. Uh, the next person in line, please. The next person in line, please. You are not here to rebut. Just make a comment. Yeah, the comment is, no, is that. I'm through. The next person in line, please. Please take a seat. Yes. Hi. Thank you for letting me speak. My name is Dr. Jeffrey Schindler. I'm the compliance officer for Greyhound Friends. I joined the board in 2017. I'm surprised that none of the witnesses who came up to speak in opposition have ever contacted me. It seems like there's a focus on the past, and I would like to believe I'm the voice of the future. I wrote the new protocols for Greyhound Friends. We specifically address long stay dogs. We specifically address contamination is issues and health and sanitary issues. We have a state-of-the-art kennel, which has three, I think you've seen, I don't want to expand on this, you've seen our new protocols, you've seen how we're going to address and all these issues that people have brought up, and I would like you to look towards the future, not towards the past, and I would like to invite any of the people who are concerned about the past to come and talk to me, because I can share with them my vision of the future of Greyhound Friends. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Schindler. Hi, this microphone, name is please. Elise Morissette. I've been involved with Greyhound Friends for well over 30 years, adopted my first Greyhound Spanky from Louise before Greyhound Friends was even formed. I was her first volunteer <laughs> at 167 Saddle Hill Road at the old Fitzpatrick Kennel. And this is just showing a pattern that has been going on for well over 30 years. I've known her the longest. I was involved for years and years. What I'm concerned about, I'm all for the animals for the best care that they can get. I wanna see Greyhound saved. But this is the, these are the same people that turned a blind eye. They had to know what was going on all these years. And this has been going on forever. And I'm just saying, please don't reinstate the license. Unless it's a brand new board, none of these people, it would be okay. I want the first most important thing is the welfare of the animals. And I've known Louise for 34 years. And just please reconsider not giving them the license. <coughs> Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Morissette. Ms. Slamon. I'm Carol Slamon from Hopkinton. I've been associated with um, the two kennels in Hopkinton for a long, long time. And I hope that you will consider doing a new license for this friends of the, um, the Greyhounds, <laughs> and that um, you separate the past from the future, and maybe if the energy all went into making it better, then it would get better. Mm -hmm. That's it. Thank you, Mrs. Slamman. Hi there. My name is Sarah Julin. I adopted a dog from Greyhound Friends in April of 2017, so I wanted to come and talk to you about a member of the public and their experience with Greyhound Friends most recently after they were shut down. Um, the Greyhound that I adopted from Greyhound Friends uh, was malnourished, underweight, bald, and according to my vet, had the highest level of hookworms that he had ever seen. Um, I have pictures of when he was first adopted, and you can see how uh, bald he was if you want to. Um, take a look at them, and then pictures of after he's been there for a while when all the hair grew back. Um, there are, I also have a letter that I attached that I sent to the state vet about my experience with Greyhound Friends and adopting and, and subsequent um, multiple treatments that it took me to try and get him healthy. 
but there is document that the Attorney General published that stated that Greyhound Friends actually tested the dog that I adopted for hookworms when he first entered the kennel. That was six months before I adopted him. He tested positive, but there is no indication of any treatments. So even shutting them down did not sort of send the message that these dogs needed to be treated medically. Um, and I was not told that he was sick because they told me that he wasn't. Um, and within two days of having him, I'm a pretty experienced dog owner, it was very obvious that he was sick, and I have veterinary records to um, reflect that. So over the time that I owned Dakota, I spent thousands of dollars on his medical treatment because they didn't treat him when they had him. Thank you. Thank you very much. Sir? My name is Michael McCann. Um, I'm past president of the Greyhound Project. We're an advocacy organization for greyhound adoption. Um, we follow greyhound uh, adoption throughout the country and throughout the world. And um, one of the first anywhere was Greyhound Friends. <coughs> there was no greyhound adoption when Greyhound Friends started. At the time, 60,000 greyhounds every year were put into the racing industry, and probably 55,000 died uh, as a direct result of euthanasia after their, their uh, their racing career was over. Louise Coleman was a pioneer, and she lost track, obviously, with just too many dogs in her kennel. And uh, her, her board uh, fought her for a long time to, to uh, bring the numbers down and bring her, uh, her kennel under control. Now that she is not part of the organization, she is the, she is the founder, but now that she's not part of the organization, I think these people are going to do a wonderful job with the Greyhounds in their care. Thank you. Thank you, sir. My name is Barbara Burnham. I live at 64 Hayden Row Street in Hopkinton. I would, after listening to everyone speak tonight, I think unfortunately it's kind of clear that we have more of the same. Officer Brennan's report clearly indicated that there are still things that need to be done at Greyhound Friends, and I'm just urging the Board of Selectmen tonight to decline their application for a license. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Burnham. Hi, my name is Kai Milhado. I am on the Board of Directors, Stoddard's wife. Um, I respectfully request that I can read a letter from our vet, Dr. Poling, who could not be here tonight. So with your permission, can I do that? How long will it take? One minute. Okay. Okay, this is from Dr. Rodney Poling, who everyone who has a Greyhound knows him. He is well known in the Greyhound community. Uh, it was dated June 5, 2018. To whom it may concern, as a practicing veterinarian in Massachusetts, I have provided a large portion of the medical and surgical services for Greyhound Friends since 1985. I've had interaction with the director, employers, board members, and adopters in thousands of cases involving veterinary care. I have also provided care for at least six other humane groups assisting in pet ad adoption efforts. I have never met anyone involved with Greyhound Friends who was not firmly committed to consistent humane treatment of the animals placed in their care and in finding good, caring, supportive homes for a breed that certainly can have special needs. They have the best physical facility for adoptions in the state. They have loyal volunteers. They have loyal, <laughs> sorry, they have loyal volunteers and supporters because it is obvious they try their best for the animals and have created a positive environment worthy of the time and financial resources people donate so to them. Only two more paragraphs. Greyhound Friends is not a perfect organization. In my opinion, they have had at times accepted dogs with issues that make it unsafe or inappropriate for adoption to take place. At times, they have dedicated many resources to a few nearly impossible cases. This might be seen as a positive, humane effort, but can overtax their resources. I also believe that their recent issues with regulatory groups stem from the Greyhound Friends trying to do too much. I also am convinced the new protocols, new management, and a recommended group of volunteers will do a better job allocating resources in a realistic way for the common good of all the animals they serve. With respect, Rodney W. Poling, DVM. Thank you, Ms. Milhada. You're welcome. <laughs> Hi, my name is Deb Coviello. I live at 27 Colonial Drive in Clinton. I'm here as a former volunteer of Greyhound Friends. 
Um, I volunteered there for two and a half years, um, starting about eight years ago. Um, I just wanted to bring up something that no one else mentioned. Um, the officer spoke of the small kennels. Um, I saw something even more horrible. I saw dogs living in very kennels. And for those of you that don't know what a very kennel is, it's the small plastic crate that you would normally put a dog in to put them in cargo if you were you know, flying across the country or something. I saw dogs living in those for weeks, um, sometimes months at a time. Um, sometimes there were very kennels on top of very kennels, and we had to have dogs living in there. Um, I feel like everybody else feels it's basically the same board. They turned a blind eye to everything while I was there. Misuse of funds and neglect of the animals, and I just don't see how anything is going to change. So I respectfully request that they not be allowed to open again. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Sir. Good evening. My name is Eric Christensen. I was a volunteer at Greyhound Friends from about 2010 until uh, they were closed down. I was there just about every Saturday for a couple hours in the morning. Um, when I got here tonight, I was gonna talk about my education experience because I did have students come from my high school that volunteered there and uh, they brought their parents as well um, because they were under the age of 16. And I would never bring students, uh, especially on my own, to volunteer at a place where I thought they're, they're in any danger whatsoever. I was very proud of them and the fact that they also want to continue volunteering there even after they uh, fulfilled their hours that they needed to be. They were members of the National Honor Society at my school. Hearing about the different changes that are coming to Greyhound Friends, um, I'm very excited because I was there the last six, seven years and it seemed like after they stopped bringing in just greyhounds and bringing in other animals, things did kind of deteriorate a little bit. And I can say tonight that I was extremely excited when I heard that they're just going to be a Greyhound place. I think that's what they're best designed for. Um, I know some of the board members that are on there now, and I don't know some of the newer ones, but I think it's a nice transition that they plan on making with, yes, having some of the old board members there, um, but bringing in new blood as well. And I hope you do grant them their license. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Sir. Hi, good evening. Uh, my name is Robert Fennessy. I'm an attorney. I'm also an adjunct professor of law at UMass Law School, where I actually teach animal law and animal rights. <clears throat> I'm a former captain with the MSPCA Law Enforcement Division. I'm not speaking on their behalf. I'm speaking on a group of people who have retained me to come up here. So I'm, I'm saving 10 people from standing in line here. So, um, so bear with me. Um, also, I was a selectman for 18 years in my own town and also was a town administrator in two towns. So I know what you're going through. And I want to commend you for putting this, uh, this hearing together in a very fair manner that Ms. you're doing. Mr. Fe D um, Mr. Fennessy, if I may interrupt, um, we were aware that there was a privately engaged town council that might be attending. Mm -hmm. And uh, according to our town council, it was his recommendation that such legal counsel be given an opportunity to speak. Yes. So I was intending on uh, calling for that individual at the close of the public comment. Okay, would you rather so you I may step down? rather take a seat and I will, I will give you okay. a brief opportunity to speak at the close of the public comment. Mr. Uh, sir. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Steve Bassignani. I live in Norfolk, Mass. First and foremost, I want to thank you. I know I've inundated you guys with information over the last 18 months. Um, I'm very passionate about rescue. I've been doing it for three years. I was called to help Emma. Uh, so we agreed to take her, and her story got worse by the day. But Emma's a happy story now. She got out of Greyhound Friends. What we have is the same people, the same exact people, except for Jeffrey, who's the husband of the new president elect. It's a family business that's failing. It's failing. And dogs suffer. That's all I get to say. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Ma'am. Hello, my name is Barbara Zeno. I live at 3 Proctor Street in Hopkinton, about two miles from Greyhound Friends. I have uh, two Greyhounds at home, a 10-year-old and a 13-year-old. And um, Grant was, uh, the current president took a special interest in him when he arrived up from Florida as he had a leg injury. Wonderful dog is 13 now. Uh, I have a plaque on one of the, um, kennels at Greyhound Friends in honor of my first four Greyhounds. There's one point I really would like to make to you, and it's about the behavior of the dogs, because their behavior problems are from their time at the track. 
they are very poorly treated at the track and live in desperate conditions. So when you bring home a greyhound, it's a wonderful thing to watch that transformation of bringing a dog back. They have the bold butts. Greyhound friends did not make the bold butts. They came from the track in that condition. I had a very badly abused dog that was adopted through Greyhound Friends. He was called a special needs adoption. He, he was so fearful, he was beaten at the track. It was not Greyhound Friends that caused him to tremble. These dogs with love and care come back and it's a beautiful thing, it changes the person. Not only gives the dog a great chance, and I really do feel positive about the changes that are being made, and I really, really would like to, and I do feel I speak for like the average person who's volunteered there. I've been volunteering for 20 years and who have a direct experience with this breed. They're a little unusual, and they've been badly treated. They get, need a second chance, and I think with this new changes and board, we have an opportunity, and I would really like you to please consider it. And one other quick point. Um, my special needs greyhound, a lot of times when you bring them home, they're not used to living in a house. They're very unusual. They actually enjoy having their little crate. I know it sounds crazy, but they do. Most of them after a week, they say, all right, I've had enough. My special needs one, he had that kennel. And believe me, I didn't think it was particularly attractive in my living room to, to go when someone came to the house because he felt safe there. These are all things from their track days. Please don't blame the kennel that is trying to move them out into homes so that, that they can become pets that are well loved and well Thank you. You know, adopted. Thank you. Thank, Thank you very much. much. We have time for one more brief comment, one minute, if you can do it. One minute. Good evening. Thank you for letting me speak. Uh, my name is Elizabeth Paul. I am a Hopkinton resident and live at Five Constitution Court. Um, I have adopted a dog from Graham Friends. He was actually rescued from another local organization and taken from Greyhound Friends because he was languishing in their care. He had been there for a couple of years and had a neglected medical issue. Um, I would like to point out that Arnold is not a Greyhound. Uh, he's a lurcher mix. Um, he has never raced and has never lived in a race track environment. Um, as I say, he was repeatedly failed to give medication, failed to give medical care, and when we actually took him into our vets, uh, his medical records from Greyhound Fens uh, weren't signed, weren't dated, and as a result, we had to get a lot of his uh, vaccinations that are required, as I understand by Massachusetts state law, uh, reissued. I therefore respectfully asked uh, the Board of Selectmen to not reinstate Greyhound Fens license. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I must close the public comment period now. Uh, 20 minutes has elapsed. As previously stated, uh, because there is a private uh, legal counsel who has been engaged, we will give that individual uh, a brief time to address the board. Uh, Mr. Fennigan, are you still here? Attorney has uh, left no, the premise. Might be in the restroom. Okay. Well, we, we're going to have to move on. Then I'm sorry. Um, okay. Uh, I will now entertain a. Uh, well, uh, we first will have time for uh, board questions to any of the witnesses or professional testifiers. Are there questions before we close the public hearing? Mr. Nesrula. Uh, Waxstein, um, one of the one of the comments was that the greyhounds do not require a larger um, kennel space; that they prefer to be in the smaller space. And um, I just wanted to get some information as to whether that's correct or not. Uh, I've heard conflicting accounts as to whether or not the, the dogs like the smaller kennels or not. Yes. Um, I really not. It would, I'm not an expert to talk about the kennel space. Um, I'm not really prepared to talk about the kennel space. I I didn't I didn't mention the kennel space in my in my statement. I know. Is. I know that there was a report by Kelly Bolin who who talked about kennel space, um, and it how it was inadequate at Greyhound Friends, but um, that re you should have that report. 
Okay. I guess what I'm trying to find out is I've, I've heard conflicting accounts as to the size of a, uh, the, the, the kennel space for a greyhound versus any other dog. Yes, I'm, I'm just not qualified to answer that question. Okay. Kelly Bowling did address that in her report and said that it is greyhounds require just as much space as the regular dog. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Finnegan, uh, since you have returned, if you would like to just, uh, as private legal counsel, address the board for two minutes, please. Good evening again. Uh, it's Fennessy, attorney. Fennessy, I'm Fennessey. sorry. Also, I'm an professor of law, as I said, at, at UMass Law School teaching animal rights, former MSPCA captain. Where I oversaw the statewide organization for animal abuse investigations and so forth. Um, as you know, I've been retained by a group of people to uh, represent them here and speak on their behalf, people who don't want to get up and are afraid to get up or something. But, but today you've heard testimony uh, that from both sides that makes it compelling as well as confusing. I mean, there's, there's two things going on here. But this testimony and letters submitted indicating the ongoing practice of Greyhound Friends of Warehousing Dogs, so to speak, some for months and some for years. There's testimony and letters submitted indicating alleged neglect of dogs kept in the care of Greyhound Friends. There's testimony and letters submitted indicating the Greyhound Friends Board of Directors turned a blind eye, you heard, to very serious deficiencies in the care of the animals, the facility needs, and especially financial uh, misuse of donated funds, much of those donations coming from Hoppington residents or area residents and businesses. And this testimony and letter submitted indicating that Greyhound Friends Board of Directors routinely dismissed major concerns over the years that were brought to them by town and state officials. At this point, I realize tonight that the board may be thinking, well, maybe they'll do better next time. And perhaps one or two may be leaning to voting to recommend a license. At the very least, that can be a risky consideration, and more importantly, if issued, that decision could potentially perpetuate the long and well-documented history of serious problems with the animals. Why do I feel that way? Because in 20 plus years as an animal abuse investigator, police captain, and court prosecutor, I handle many complaints of animal, animal neglect, unsanitary conditions, and failure to provide proper veterinary care for animals. And I inspected hundreds of kennels uh, pet shops, uh, research facilities, <coughs> etc. <coughs> and having read through the vol voluminous uh, state enforcement reports, letters, articles regarding Greyhound Friends past history, I'm extremely leery that this organization, who is keeping nearly all of its same members of the board at this time, is incapable of doing a full turnaround. In fact, I think any organization without a full change of a board, or at least a, uh, a, a supermajority change of the board, uh, would not be able to pull that off. <coughs> so even though Greyhound Friends Board agreed to governance steps and oversight after Mass Attorney General Maura Haley found that the Board of Directors, and I quote, failed to ensure operations and management decisions in the best interest of the organization, can they now be trusted to ensure such decision in the best interest of Greyhound Friends. So clearly, we all love animals. That's why this room is filled today. And we all wanna see shelters and rescue groups flourish to help prevent abuse and neglect, provide proper housing and sanitary environment, and proper medical care for the dogs they take in as a rescue. But as we can clearly see through the history here, there was a consistent disregard by the Board of Directors and the management to do so. Having been a selectman, I can imagine that you're wondering what happens to the future dogs if we don't issue a license? Where do they go? Well, believe me, there are dozens and dozens of properly maintained and fiscally prudent humane rescue groups, animal welfare shelters, and foster placement groups that do the job right. And these groups have been taking in those dogs that perhaps were earmarked for Greyhound Friends since their closure more than a year and a half ago. And there were no problems whatsoever. No. There's a well-known saying by a philosopher about 100 years ago, 
George Santayana that couldn't be more prophetic at this time in this situation. And it is, those who do not, do not learn from history are doomed to repeat it. We have a long and well-documented history spanning decades here. And we respectfully request that the Board of Selectmen prevent the history from repeating itself and vote a non-recommendation for licensure to the town clerk. Thank you. Thank you, Attorney Finnegan. Fennessy. Fennessy, I, I knew it's one or the other. I was bound to get it wrong. Um, we will return to the board <coughs> question period now. Madam Chairman, if I may, I believe there was a question that was unanswered about an opinion about kennel size. And there is somebody in the audience who may be able to answer that with a Greyhound background, Mr. McCann, if the board was interested in hearing that. I don't believe the question was answered. Can he speak yes. briefly? been a greyhound adopter, a greyhound owner, uh, and a volunteer for 30 years. Um, I've made many trips to, to greyhound uh, tracks to pick up dogs, bring them to adoption groups all over the country. Um, the kennels in uh, the tracks typically have a 42-inch kennel for each dog. There are two levels. The females are usually on the top, the males are on the bottom. There's usually 60 dogs in a kennel. Uh, the, the kennels themselves are 42 inches by 24 inches. And um, the, the uh, kennels at Greyhound Friends are significantly larger than that. Uh, I have a dog that I saved from Florida uh, who is on the run for two years after being adopted in Florida. I made four trips to Florida to try to catch her. When I caught her, finally, after two years, uh, I opened up my van, which had a crate in the back of it, 42-inch crate. She saw the crate, jumped right in. She's still in a crate at home. I leave the door open all the time. They love their crates. Thank you, sir. So. Um, w with all due respect, um, I personally believe that there is a difference between a kenneling situation in a racetrack environment where animals are raced every day to consistent confinement. And I would be interested for many of our other kennel professionals here if there are other standard sizes, the kennels I have seen everywhere for animals are consistently larger when they're going to be kept. Dr. Lyndon Mayer, can you speak to this, please? I'd just like to say that the difference here is that in the case of some of these folks who have adopted greyhounds, that animal has a choice. He just mentioned that the door is open. The dog can come in and go out as he or she pleases. When a dog is confined to a very kennel or a small, a small kennel for a long period of time, there is no choice. So it's a question of, is the dog stuck there for a long period of time without being able to get out? Or does it have the opportunity to get out and chooses not to? And that, to me, is really the difference. Thank you. Other board questions? If there are no other questions from the board, I will entertain a motion to close the public hearing. So moved. Second. A motion has been made and seconded to close the public hearing. Madam Chair. Mr. Hart. Before we vote, I just want to take a minute and thank everyone that came this evening for offering your thoughts and opinions in a respectful and reasonable way. We had a couple little periods of energy there, but I think uh, everyone's done a really nice job helping us understand the issue, and everyone's done a really nice job keeping their emotions in check. I get the reason for the emotions, and uh, I didn't hear one person speaking tonight that didn't have the love of the dogs in their heart. So that's what's most important here, and I want to thank you all for conducting yourselves appropriately. Thank you, Mr. Herr. All those in favor of closing the public hearing, please signify by saying aye. 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 And opposed, that is unanimous. The public hearing has been closed. What this means is the time for public comment and the time for public questioning and the receipt of new information is concluded. The board will now deliberate amongst itself. All are welcome to observe, but there will be no more public input. Comments by the board.
<laughs> exactly. So, so we're not uh, we're not done. Yeah. If you guys want to, you can stay and listen quietly, or you can leave the room. We still have business to conduct. Board member comments. Well, for me, it comes down to accountability. Now, it seems like um, I, I'm hearing that Louise is, is the sacrificial lamb here, and, and, and if Louise is gone, everything's going to be perfect again. Um, but this happened under a board's watch. When stuff happens in the town, it's under our watch, and, and we take heed for it. Um, uh, for me, uh, unless there's a full change of, of the people that were on board when all of this went down, uh, I, I can't see how it can uh, how, it, how it can go forward. You know, uh, hearing the hearing the, the the comment that they're better off from where they came from isn't good enough. You know, we 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 hear about the size of the kennels, how small they were in the tracks. Well, that's why we're getting rid of racetracks. You know, we got rhythm in Massachusetts. They're, they're working on Florida now, and they're working on everywhere else. We were talking about the, you know, the size of the kennels, and that, that, that really only 10 of them allow, the, allow a male to, to turn around. <coughs> now, I, I've, I've, I've got a Doby. I'm on my fifth Doberman, and, um, and she loves her crate too. But she can come in and out of it. She goes in there when people come in there. She can hide in there, and she loves it. But they're able to come and go, you know. And and it's all about what's best for the best for the dogs. Um, it's 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 a wonderful thing that we have an organization that stepped up when when it when it was needed. They were the first ones to come forward and do it. But. You know, it, 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 the way I see it, they, they may have run, run the course because to have incidences come up every single year, and I'm gonna fix it, it'll get fixed, it'll get fixed. Now, I, I do that stuff at home. I don't get to my wife's list all the time, but, but this, is, this doesn't involve animal welfare. Um, and it shouldn't be up to the town or, or regula regulators to catch these things. It should be up to the people that are running it to want to make sure that everything's perfect. But that's just the way I, I, I see it. Is that um, I, with with this, this with many of the same people still running it, I, I, I can't see it and anything really changing. You know, I I you know, I I love to have have Greyhound friends back up and running and working, but if the, this if um, the same people. You know, and I and I appreciate the, the one of the directors coming down to to want to run, but you were there, you were there when the stuff happened. Should have stopped it, not just say I'm going to run it now, but that's me. To dovetail on Mr. Catino's um, statements, while well, well, I agree with everything he has to say, um, I would think that. If you're coming in for a hearing today, asking for your license to be reinstated, and one of the things that, you know, some of the things that were found at fault, they should all be corrected by now. We shouldn't have a, a, a inspection reveal that there's still no hot water. Uh, we shouldn't have the inspection reveal that the record keeping is still subpar, uh, that they still can't account for one of the dogs. It just makes me think, are we going through the motions here? Is all of the all the I's should be dotted and T's should be crossed? Everything should have been ship shape. If you if you're coming back after everything we've been through, when you come back here, I would expect that the application would be complete. And from what uh, from what I can see, it's just not. So I have a, I have a hard time um, I have a hard time saying that things are going to get better. Mr. Mayor, can I ask a question to Mr. Mayor, please? Chair? Sure. What's our role here? Well, your, your role is 
if you want to make a recommendation um, concerning whether you believe that the license should be issued. You do not have a formal role in the issuance of this license. It's to be based on the inspection, and the town clerk really has to just follow the results of the inspection. So, um, but what you do have a role in, and what we were trying to address by having the hearing now, is that um, once a license is in place, it's a pretty easy um, hurdle um, for a petition to be submitted to you to revoke it. And rather than go through the ping pong uh, process of issuing a license and then turning around and revoking it, um, well, we thought it was wiser to uh, give you an opportunity to review the evidence and to express your opinion so that Greyhound Friends could decide accordingly whether they want to go forward with applying for the license and um, taking the chances that it, that, that it might end up getting revoked. So um, um, your role here is advisory, but the important piece of advice that, that uh, the town clerk will have is from the results of the inspection. So has the application been submitted? Yes. And the town clerk will now make a decision on the application based on basically Lieutenant Bennett's inspection? That's correct. Okay. So and, and, and assu let's assume for discussion's sake for a moment, if based on that inspection report, whatever, he decides to issue the license, we then, or somebody could bring to us a petition to have that license immediately revoked. That's correct. So we're basically avoiding that step of playing that little circular game. So, so we hope let me just play a scenario out. Yes. This license submitted. Let's say the clerk takes a look at, look at it, sees everything's up to what he determines is satisfactory. Yes. Issues the license. Yes. If either X amount of complaints or a petition with X amount of signatures comes in, mm -hmm. we would potentially be called to action to go down tomorrow or that day to reinspect that kennel. There would be a, there would have to be a new inspection, and then you would have to hold a hearing. And then at that point, the results would be forwarded to us. We would have a hearing and we would make a determination and that our, that's our sole discretion at that point the board of selectmen's discretion to pull the license to, to, that's to pull correct. The license. so i have nothing to add uh yes to her so um having done this for over a decade now please don't start making assumptions till i finish what i'm going to say um because i go off on tangents sometimes for whatever reason i heard mrs slamman used the term or she mentioned the words consider a new license so mr. Catino at some point would you consider a new license yes do you have any stipulations as to what that would look like or is it well, too early to well it, it would just just what I was saying a, 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 a complete change <coughs> uh, you know it, it's it's you know it's sort of like when when a, when a restaurant uh, has has uh, issues in it they open up they, they close down open up under a new name under new management you see under new management I asked the question I'm over yes. here oh yeah <laughs> sorry. we're having the discussion sorry sir so you would consider a new license at some point yes okay thank you um, I heard someone mention he or she was the voice of the future for um, Greyhound friends in Hopkinton do we do we as a board think there's a future for Greyhound Friends in Hopkinton under certain conditions or situ uh, certain situations? Or are we as a board talking about having Greyhound Friends just go away? I think that's a fundamental question that we have to be willing to have a discussion about tonight. I'm not sure that that's germane to this hearing. There's a question before us, our recommendation on the licensure, and that's what this hearing is about. And I don't know that it's uh, this board's purview to start making predictions or recommendations for the future there's one question before us tonight I, I disagree I think that this is all about the future of Greyhound friends and one is it going to exist in Hopkinton 
whether it exists or not is not entirely up to us. I would agree with that. But whether it exists in Hopkinton or not, if, if Mr. Gattino is willing someday to consider approving a license if certain situations or, or criteria are met, then you know I think that has to be part of the discussion now. In other words, so I'll just jump to the end game for me before I make a couple other points. I am not inclined to support the issuance of a license tonight, period. I shouldn't say I'm not inclined. I would not vote to support the issuance of a license tonight. That does not mean, Mrs. Wright, that someday in the future I wouldn't support a new application coming back to this board if that had some specific things on it. For example, every board member has to change. So that's what I want to talk about because I think it's an important message for the community full of people that love dogs. And Hopkinton as a community loves and wants to protect dogs. I don't think our, our bosses, as I mentioned way early in the meeting, I don't think the town of Hopkinton is opposed to Greyhound Friends existing and thriving and supporting dogs in Hopkinton in the future. I think it is very strongly opposed to issuing a license right now under the current management structure. I think Maury Healy is doing a wonderful job on behalf of Massachusetts. I really do. In this particular case, she did not go nearly far enough in dealing with the board structure and the situation with the Board of Greyhound Friends. A couple other quick thoughts. I heard someone say, and this is tied to it, I heard someone mention the word dismantling. I have zero interest, personally, and I don't think Hopkinton has any interest in dismantling and ending Greyhound Friends. I think Hopkinton would support a dog rescue center for Greyhounds and others, perhaps, in Hopkinton at the facility, at the right kind of facility, with the right maintenance, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I don't see that today. But I think Hopkinton, but I don't think we want to dismantle. I don't want to dismantle it, but I do want to fix it. And the only way to fix it is to stop it and truly restart it. Uh, and lastly, um, uh, you know, just forgetting all that was discussed tonight, uh, and I, again, I didn't hear anybody, anything but love in, in the heart of everybody that spoke about dogs tonight. I'm, I'm on this board, I'm on a board at Dana Farber Cancer Institute, I'm on the Metro West Regional Transit Authority Board. I'm on the Board of Trustees at Framingham State University. I'll stop there. I'm on a lot of different boards. Um, this is a classic organizational failure. It's a classic business failure, too, if you want to look at it from a business perspective. You have the founder of the business. <clears throat> Guess who doesn't work at Microsoft anymore? Bill Gates. You have the founder of a business creating this entity out of love and passion all great things and over time the founder starts to get in the way and over time something has to happen and in this case based on the testimony and a lot of other sort of data points that we've all received clearly the board had a hard time managing the founder and as reason and that's that, that's classic that happens in business every day that's why businesses fail every day 80% of businesses or whatever the number is, 70% are gonna fail in the first five years for very similar situations like this. So this took longer to evolve and this took longer to blow up, but I do believe it has blown up. So I think we're in a situation right now where I would support what Mr. Catino said and what, what Mr. Nasrula said, um, <coughs> specific to the board members. Uh, I, I, I would like to see a Greyhound Friends organization in Hockington thrive. I do not see it happening with the current board. I don't know how, Mr. Town Council, we sort through that, if we even have authority to sort through that. But, you know, I personally just need to see a whole new application with lots of new people, with lots of credentials that are going to protect dogs going forward. Well, this organization has a long history in this town, going back to 1988. And I, for one, have been around that long and remember lots of things going back to 1988. Um, the timeline that was displayed is, is nothing new. We've seen that. Uh, it's a very powerful statement of the history of problems going back to 1988. Um, the volume of materials, the documented problems that this board has received um, including from animal welfare professionals and from people with first-hand experience is, is, is truly overwhelming. Um, and the level of public outcry 
including uh, you know 1,800 uh, pleas from literally around the globe, is is humbling. Really has to give give us pause. Um, would we expect or want something like that for Little Hopkinton? The level of resources, the number of professional and protection organizations that have had to come into our town to try to correct a 30-year problem. Um, Mr. Her and I don't always agree on things. I would caution that he may be speaking his own feelings, but I would not make assumptions about how the rest of the cities of Ho the citizens of Hopkinton feel about the continuance of this organization. There has been a, from what I've seen, a 30 years worth of effort to correct problems <coughs> at the Greyhound Friends. There has been discipline. There have been warnings. There are conditions set by the town to no avail. Every corrective measure <coughs> recommended by animal welfare professionals has been ignored. They've not been carried out. Somehow, it always reverts to the same conditions. Overcrowding, ill animals, lack of veterinary care, cramp quarters, there's the same problems for 30 years, and I've seen them myself because I was around. It's the same conduct. To me, I see an, an, an inability and an unwillingness of this organization to comply with the requirements for humane care. I question whether our town or the animal protection organizations can continue this kind of oversight. Monthly checks, regular babysitting, Every time one takes their eye off the ball, there's recidivism. 30 years we've been trying to fix the problems of Greyhound Friends, and 30 years it's failed. So I have to ask myself, why should an organization that's got it wrong for 30 years still have credibility? Yes, Louise Coleman was the driving force, but they were more people than Louise Coleman, and they saw it. And they, and they participated, there is complicity here. I know their hearts may have been in the right place, but at the end of the day, the animal suffering continued. Now, I look at this organization and I say, what's in a name? Shakespeare said, what's in a name? Groups call themselves humane. They call themselves a rescue. They call themselves friends. But it's what goes on inside that matters. How do we get here? I think I know how we got here. Because in the past, a succession of good-hearted people, boards of selectmen and town officials, they wanted to think and they wanted to believe the best. There's goodness and compassion in all our human hearts. We want to help such a noble mission. And so we overlook or we excuse or we deny or we give second, third, fourth chances. It's happened time and time again. The better, the better angels of our nature don't want to believe. But at a certain point, we must believe or be naive. It's not about paint. It's not about fencing. I don't want to hear about a light bulb. This is, those are topical things. What I see going on here for 30 years is a problem that is much, much deeper. It's the fiber, it's the muscle, it's into the soul. We're housing dogs for years, confining them in small spaces, denying their most basic emotional needs. Anybody could see this. Why would this be allowed to go on year after year? This is not something that gets corrected by paint or by a washing machine. And the way I see it, 30 years of trying hasn't fixed it. This organization has consistently not demonstrated an ability to comply with the requirements of humane care. So I mean no disrespect, but I will mention there's an old saying that everyone knows, and it says, fool me once, shame on you. Fool me twice, shame on me. Well, we're far beyond twice in this town, and I'm sorry, enough is enough. I cannot support this organization in this town. Make me a motion. 
So the motion that the motion that you want, someone needs to make a motion either to recommend to the town clerk either that they, that he issue the license or that he not issue the license. Your but you should make it clear that yours is a recommendation and it's based on the on the hearing that you made okay. that you've um, conducted today. Would someone like to make a motion? I'm going to make a motion that uh, the Board of Selectmen recommend to the clerk to not to issue the license. Is there second. a second? Second. Motion has been made and seconded that the Board of Selectmen recommend to the town clerk not to issue a kennel license. Is that what you have, Mrs. Lazarus? Discussion. Mr. Her? Discussion? Um, Mr. Mieri, so with this motion, without having any timeline on that motion really, right, um, would that preclude us from someday in the future reconsidering or taking this issue up again uh, should someone submit another application to the community or want to submit another application to the community? Do we create some kind of jeopardy here or double jeopardy or some legal term I know nothing about? Um, you are uh, addressing whether the license should be issued based on the record that has been created here. That is the application, the um, inspector's report, the documents that, that were read into the record, um, and um, the hearing testimony that you had today. Uh, your recommendation is based on that. <coughs> In another circumstance in the future, there may be a different circumstance, there may be a different recommendation, and what you do today would certainly not bind what you do in the future. So, so to, to piggyback off of that, if this group came to us tomorrow as Greyhound pals and decide and, and had Lieutenant Bennett come in or whomever, do an inspection and everything was up to par, at that point can they resubmit another license tomorrow? Or can they do it as Greyhound friends? Does the, does, if Mr. Deegan doesn't issue the license on its merit, does that preclude them from resubmitting under the exact same thing with a different board, say, uh, in a day? Or is there a time frame that they need to wait or? There is no time frame they need to wait. Uh, if it's the, um, uh, if a organization, either with the same name or a different name, but, it, but if it were actually an entirely different organization with different board of directors, um, uh, I, my guess based on, on the conversation we've hear, heard here is that that would present a different situation for some of you um, and maybe that would not for others. But um, um, the... Uh, the fact that the license was uh, denied by the clerk would not preclude the organization, either the same organization or a different organization, coming forward in the future and uh, saying, we would now like to be considered as an entirely different application. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Mr. Herb? Mrs. And Lazarus, can you read the motion that's before us again, please? Well, before that, Mr. Kamal, did you have a, a comment? In, in fact, it's in relation to the motion. Okay. Uh, based on Mr. Miara's response to Brian Hare's question, I, wanted, I was wondering whether the board would be willing to revise the motion uh, and insert at the beginning of the motion the phrase, uh, based on the testimony received at today's hearing, and then at the language that was used by uh, yes, Mr. Right. Sure. How, how about based on the evidence, because there was written uh, okay. documentation and what have you, not just testimony. All right. All right. So, so do you take that friendly amendment? I take that uh, friendly amendment. And I'll second that. All right. Thank you. So I'm good now with the link. So, okay. to read to so I will ask that that uh, motion be read back. It's been seconded. Please read the motion back. Based on the evidence presented at the hearing, uh, today, the board recommends the town clerk and not issue the license. Okay, thank you. 
All those in favor I'm of sorry. Mr. Kerr. Mr. Mieris, are you good with that motion? I guess the license should probably say, does it issue a license to Greyhound Friends Inc. in accordance with its current application? Yes, I accept with that friendly amendment. amendment. <laughs> <laughs> I'm good with that as a second. All right, let's hear that one more time so everyone knows what we're voting on. Based on the evidence presented at the public the hearing. Not here and here. Back here. A little louder. Based on the evidence presented at the public hearing, the board recommends to the town clerk that he not issue the license to Greyhound Friends in accordance with its current application. Thank you. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 And opposed, it is unanimous. Thank you very much. Thank you everyone for participating and for your patience at this late hour. Uh, we have covered the other agenda items, liaison reports, board invites. Um, so I will entertain a motion to adjourn. Motion to adjourn. Second. Second. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 And oppose it. Unanimous don't leave their signatures. Thank you, everyone. Okay, there's lots.